Fifty well, well made, some, some of my favourite and some of my favourite head the girl family with you who have kept me sane throughout the kept me sane throughout the endless nights of chit chat nights of voice chat and I cannot be I cannot be happy this year. I will let them this year. I will let them introduce themselves with Mariam and Anna. Yeah, sure. I mean, you guys sure. I mean, you guys met a little bit earlier. Although those you've just joined, although those you've just joined, I'm sorry again. So I am a workshop leader. Uh, the workshop leaders this year. Uh, in collaboration with Anna. Uh, in collaboration with Anna. Well. She is well. the workshop leader as well. Well, let her herself as well a little bit. Hi, um, um, I'm Anna. Hi, I'm um, the other one. I'm the other one. And, 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 and I just worked with Marianne. I just worked with Marianne. Um, changing the um, changing the emails and just being in touch with our volunteers and the schools that we work with. And last but not least, and last but not least, I'm Hi, I'm the social sec this year. Social sec this year. First ever social sec. First ever social sec. No, I've just been working. No, I've just been working with socials. We're educate members. We're educate members. But I have lots of bits. But I have lots of bits. I just do whatever anyone in educate needs to do. Basically, that's my role. So that's my role. Yeah, 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 that's my um, um, so please yeah, have you guys helping me out and they're happy guys helping me out and a lot a lot a lot a lot um, lot during the day and um, throughout the evening, day as well, and but throughout the evening uh, I'll, I'll let you guys um, I'll let you guys what, what we're gonna, gonna be showing next. next what we're gonna be showing next um, right, right, so next um, we're going to have, right, so an, next we're going to have an interview with normal lamps with normal lamps contribution to mental health contribution to mental health Hello everyone and welcome back. Um, I'm Jake, I'm Vice President of Hedgecate and I'm here with Tori, President of Hedgecate and Sir Norman Lamb. Norman's going to talk about a little bit about himself and his work. Um, Norman, we'd love to hear more about what you do. Could you, could you tell us a bit more? Well, uh, I don't know how long you want, the short or the long version. But um, So I was a member of parliament for uh, 18 and a half years had the great honour of representing North Norfolk, um, which is sort of Cromer, Sheringham, the Norfolk Broads, across to Wells, next to the sea. Um, I stood down at the last election um, and I, because I, I was ready to stand down. I wanted to sort of take on a, a different challenge. Um, and I have become chair of the uh, South London and Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust which is the Mental Health Trust, which is sort of my passion. Um, I was fortunate enough to become minister responsible for mental health between 2012 and 2015. And um, that gave me the opportunity to sort of drive change and to try and get mental health more on the map, to uh, uh, you know, fight with others to reduce the stigma, uh, to uh, fight for equal treatment for those with mental ill health uh, and equal treatment within the NHS because mental health services are very frequently disadvantaged just the way the system works. Um, so I, that, that was a very sort of invigorating uh, time when you, you felt you could actually make some progress. And I introduced the first ever uh, access standards uh, in mental health, you know, how long you have to wait before you get treatment that was particularly in um, early intervention in psychosis, uh, but also access to talking therapies. Um, and uh, we massively expanded the IAPT program, which is the talking therapy program. Um, we produced a sort of blueprint for the modernization of children's mental health services, got more funding for children's mental health services. But, uh, you know, I, it was always a case of, you know, trying to do as much as you could in the time that you had available to you. Um, I'm also now, uh, along with Chair of South London and Maudsley, I chair the Children and Young People's Mental Health Coalition, um, which is a national coalition of uh, charities and other organisations working in the field of mental health with children and young people. Um, and I also chair an advisory board for a digital mental health company. This is uh, it's called Cooth, 
but it's uh, to give people access to support on their phone, basically, um, which is something that I think has to be part of the overall offer to people uh, in modern times, particularly given that so often people are left waiting far too long for access to traditional support. Uh, so I think access immediately over your phone to support uh, is quite important. So that, that gives you a flavour of what I'm about. Oh, you muted yourself, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that I was muted. Um, we, all, we all suffer from it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. Um, we have read a bit about you, and you've just covered a quite. You've covered quite a bit of, of stuff that you've been up to there, and from our reading, you've we've we've learned that you've debated about many issues for North Norfolk, from orthopedic waiting times to lack of school transport services, all, all the way to coastal erosion. Um, can you tell us a bit more about maybe one or two projects or achievements in a bit more depth, perhaps ones that you've been more, most passionate about? I think um, I, I got elected in 2001 in North Norfolk. I, I was a Liberal Democrat. Uh, I was trying to defeat the uh, Conservative Member of Parliament. Um, I stood first in 1992. So it was my third attempt when I finally got elected. So I've been working to break down a 15,500 Conservative majority over a period of about 11 years. Uh, we finally made the breakthrough uh, in 2001. And I think the thing that, um, in a way, I'm sort of proudest of is the work I did with individuals. It, it, it's very often uh, people go through massive challenges in their life, uh, often, you know, traumatic experiences, or mums and dads uh, fighting for their children who might have special needs in school. Um, all those who need access to mental health support. You know, in my last year, I was working with two teenagers, one female, one male, um, both of whom had waited a year for access to mental health services in Norfolk. Um, and quite often through uh, persistence and through a willingness to spend time on it, you could make a real difference for people. And... And I, you know, I, that's part of an MP's responsibility. Uh, and I think, I, you know, uh, I'm proud of some of the things that I did to help individual families. And you can, you know, sometimes you make a difference to people's lives in, in quite a meaningful way. Um, and at a national level, when I was minister, I, I, I came across so many people who um, experienced unacceptable treatment um, within the NHS, um, people with learning disability, people with autism. Uh, I can remember there was a great scandal involving a place called Winterbourne View um, back in about 2011, something like that. And this, this exposed um, uh, people with learning disability being abused in a private hospital. Uh, but placed there by the state and funded by the state. And um, I remember talking to a dad whose son was a, an adult patient at Winterbourne View. And I can remember him saying, you know, I tried to complain. I watched him become increasingly zombie-like. He was obviously being pumped full of antipsychotics. And, uh, and, and that was his father's view, that he was becoming increasingly zombie-like. But he said, I complained to the local NHS and the local council and no one did anything about it. And he, he said, I, I, I felt guilty that I could do nothing for my son. And that really horrified me, the, the sense of an unresponsive state, um, badly letting down uh, an individual in that way. And... And I ended up taking up quite a lot of individual cases as a minister um, because I felt that by doing that, I mean, A, you could make a difference to those families, but B, it, kept, it really kept you grounded and kept you informed about how bad things could be for people. Um, and, you know, we've had our own family experience of mental ill health uh, and um, 
our oldest son was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder as a teenager. Uh, my oldest sister took her own life in her mid 60s uh, a few years ago. Um, so we've gone through the trauma that many families have experienced. Um, and that sort of informed my work in mental health and my determination to try to improve the experience of people who need help. Um, uh, so I think my, you know, the work on mental health, uh, uh, the, the first waiting time standards, um, we rolled out something called liaison and diversion, which is to ensure that there is a, a clinician, a, a, a nurse, for example, in uh, police stations where people get arrested uh, and, and uh, sent for interview or, at, or and in courts. So that if someone turns in, up in the criminal justice system who has a mental health issue, that they can be identified and referred for treatment rather than just their mental ill health being ignored by the system. Uh, uh, that's quite an important uh, development. I set up something called Think Ahead, which is training uh, large numbers of people now in mental health social work. Um, uh, it takes top graduates. It's a bit like Teach First, if you know Teach First, uh, but it's a uh, route into mental health social work for graduates. It's now in the Times top whatever of best recruiters. Um, it's a really impressive organisation. And mental health social work was a real sort of Cinderella area of service. And now we're getting a whole co cohort of bright graduates going into that very important area. So. You know, the, there are quite a few things over the years that I feel were worth doing. Um, also, lots of total frustrations along with, along with the successes, I guess. Yeah, I mean, thank you for that. I mean, my next question was going to be a little about kind of how mental health was involved in your work as a politician. But I think we have sorry, just answered that one. You. That, that's all right. That's all right. Um, what about kind of one of the, I mean, Jake mentioned a few other non-mental health related things, maybe share with us what, what was your, your biggest achievement from those? Yeah, it's, um, I think, I mean, I, I became, uh, as a new MP, um, very interested uh, in healthcare generally, um, and indeed in social care. Um, care for elderly people, care for people with disabilities, um, uh, and uh, ended up as a, uh, uh, the Lib Dem health spokesperson in opposition and then, of course, had my time in the government. Um, and uh, I uh, did a lot of work to um, make the case for certain changes within the NHS and within social care, uh, in part about ensuring that mental health is treated equally, but also ensuring that the system is more joined up. It can be very fragmented. Um, you know, different parts of our body get treated as separate entities. Uh, uh, and if you have a physical health problem, you may well have psychological, um, there may be psychological consequences of that chronic condition. And likewise, people with significant mental ill health um, quite often experience uh, physical health problems, um, but the system spectacularly neglects the psychological needs of people with physical health problems, but manages also to neglect the physical health needs of people with mental ill health. So joining it up, integrating it more effectively was something that I uh, felt very strongly about. I also took the CARE Act through Parliament in um, 2014, and that is very much about putting the well-being of the individual at the heart of decision making. I think it's I think it was a very good piece of legislation. By the end of it, we tried to be as open to amendments as possible as it went through Parliament. Um, uh, I think its impact has been undermined by a lack of resources. Um, part of the purpose of it was to uh, seek to uh, give more power to the individual. Um, 
uh, I don't know whether you've ever heard of something called personal budgets, but this is if if you if you have a if you're being supported by the council with your social care needs, you know, with dressing, with eating, with uh, other personal needs. Um, the traditional way of doing it is that the council just decides what's best for you and you get it whether you like it or not. With a personal budget, the idea of it, and this actually came from disabled people themselves who uh, fought for more rights in social care. And the idea is it should be the individual who chooses what's a priority for them, uh, not the council. Um, and so put the individual in charge of the budget and how it is spent and who they choose as their care team and so on. Uh, and uh, we, we, we sort of um, entrenched that concept in legislation in the CARE Act. But again, you know, if, if the budgets are so squeezed that the personal budget is cut back to the bare minimum, it doesn't do much to really empower the individual to lead a happy and good life. So, um, you know, I, I think it's a good basis for a, 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 an enlightened and uh, progressive approach, but it's undermined by lack of resources. Thank you. Yeah, I guess, I guess that brings us on to our next question. Which is, could you tell us a bit more about what you've been up to since leaving Parliament um, and after your uh, the uh, since you stepped down from being a politician? Yeah, so along with being a, the chair of the South London Maudsley <laughs> NHS Trust, um, I chair the Children and Young People's Mental Health Coalition. Uh, I chair the advisory board for uh, Cooth, this digital mental health company. But we also, when I announced I was standing down from Parliament, uh, Mary, my wife, and I uh, announced that we were setting up a Norfolk Mental Health Fund. Uh, and we've, that was so that we, we announced it at the end of August last year. We've got it up now to, uh, I think, just over 200,000. Uh, of course, raising money for a charitable purpose is, is much tougher during COVID. Um, Everyone is more anxious about spending money because they're uncertain about the future. And uh, uh, and of course, companies are uh, often, um, uh, you know, fighting to survive. So it's tougher. Um, but we've got it up to 200,000 and we're going to start fairly soon to um, uh, start giving out money to um grassroots organisations in Norfolk who are supporting uh, particularly children and teenagers uh, and at a much earlier stage supporting attempts to prevent a deterioration of health. You know, I think the system at the moment is uh, it's sort of like feels like crisis management. No one gets any help until things are really desperate. So uh, let's support organisations that uh, support young people much earlier on. Uh, and hopefully stop that deterioration happening in the first place. Yeah, and that's really like what, what we're all about at, yeah. at Educate with our, our workshops in schools. We really try and reach children before it gets to that point. And so like also giving them kind of someone of a re like close peer age to kind of talk through with it and ask questions. Um, and speaking of Cooth as well that you mentioned, we've seen a lot about Cooth around and for anyone that doesn't know about it, it's for young people um, up to age of 25. So majority yeah. of uni students are also included under it. And it tells you a lot of places where you can um, access kind of different services. There's like a chat function as well. Um, and yeah, we're hoping um, as Hedgecate to work with the Manfold, Man, Mancroft Advice Project to yeah. kind of facilitate, um, again, helping with the kind of local community organizations more as well. Um, well, it's brilliant. So I think what you're doing is very much aligned with what I'm interested in. And uh, a, a massive credit to you lot for what you're doing at Educate. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, initiative. Uh, and I think, uh, I mean, the Mancroft Advice Project, I happen to be a patron of uh, MAP. Uh, they're a very good organisation. Um, 
I think that the sort of idea of Couth is really good that it enables a young person, the traditional health service response is, you know, we, we will tell you what you need. Um, it's quite sort of paternalistic. Whereas with the Couth platform, uh, a young person can go onto it, they can find out a whole range of information, um, they can choose to go into a moderated chat room and often talking to other people who are going through similar difficulties uh, is quite cathartic and uh, powerful. And they can get access to one-to-one -one counselling support. So, and, and without a sort of one-year waiting list, you know, you could book your slot tomorrow or whatever it might be. So I think, uh, I think that's, it's, it's not the solution on its own. It's very important to stress that. But I think a modern approach involves, you know, must involve digital support uh, because we all live with our phones the whole time. But uh, I'm also very attracted by, uh, there's an approach in uh, Australia called Headspace, um, which is, it was set up by someone called Pat McGorry, uh, who I've got to know reasonably well. And, and basically it's a sort of easy access, non-stigmatized youth service. So you don't have to get referred by your GP, you could just, you know, rock up there. Uh, and it deals with all the sort of teenage angst type of issues. It's not narrowly a mental health service, but if you're worried about your sexuality, if you're worried about drugs or alcohol issues, if you're worried about a potential job that you might be going into, um, whatever your particular anxiety might be, go along and talk to someone at Headspace. And I think that sort of approach and MAP is a similar sort of concept, really. But I think that every part of the country should have access to that sort of support. Uh, and so I would love to see the sort of Headspace national branding uh, translated into this country so that wherever you live across the country, you get access to Headspace type of support. Yeah, that sounds great. And I guess that kind of answered a little bit of my next question a little bit um so sorry I'm just gonna... i keep preempting you. no that's okay that that's good at least we've got a good structure um <laughs> so in relation to some some of the stuff that we've talked about what what future plans do you have if there's anything you can divulge to us well you know i think um in norfolk we're with the with the fund that we've set up we're very keen to help um build a network of these uh, organizations I mean map is map is now very substantial and it's gets quite a lot of funding from the council and so on but you think about being in some town in rural Norfolk uh, a long way away from Norwich uh, you could be very isolated from support there and there are some organizations there's one in Downham Market in West Norfolk there's another one uh, in Holt in North Norfolk, which is part of my constituency called the Holt Youth Project, another one in Great Yarmouth. Now, could we link all of these up in a sort of coalition um, and uh, they could benefit from, you know, access to training, to support? Um, and, uh, and could we create something that's greater than the sum of its parts, as it, as it were? And I, I suppose my ambition is that let's try and make Norfolk an exemplar for how to do this well. Uh, it, Norfolk's had lots of problems in the past. It's had a mental health service that's been in special measures. It's had children's services in special measures. Uh, we've got very high rates of children being taken into care. Uh, we've got very high rates of exclusion from school, something that I feel very strongly about. It's uh, generally, uh, far too much used uh, and and once a child is excluded from school the sort of slippery slope down to uh, no educational qualifications uh, worklessness and too often the criminal justice system it, is dreadful and this is a sort of complete failure of the system to support children many of whom are have behavioral issues because of what they've gone through in their life uh, and we then punish them more by excluding them. Uh, it's a very uncivilized approach. And so 
I would like Norfolk to demonstrate a more enlightened approach to supporting young people. Uh, and I think we've got, you know, the, the potential to do it, uh, but there's a long way to go. Thank you. Yeah. Quite a way to go indeed. Um, mm -hmm. But it, is, it sounds like there's some positivity yeah. to be found, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. So, We've, I think we might have covered it already a little bit because you were talking about your own kind of personal experiences and the fact you've worked with people on kind of individual cases earlier. But my next question is, um, what made you interested in working um, with mental health topics um, in the first place? Or was it a gradual process? Well, it was gradual. Uh, I, I became a sort of spokesperson for health back in about 2000 and seven I think and I began to sort of see how mental health was disadvantaged within the NHS that the money um, tends to flow into acute hospitals um, the previous Labour government in the last decade who put a lot of extra money into the NHS and introduced maximum waiting time standards uh, all of which I support I think was a good thing but they left out mental health from those maximum waiting time standards. And so if you have an imbalance of rights between mental health and physical health, um, the whole of the system, if you can imagine it, they're all thinking we've got to be sure that we meet those waiting time standards, like the four hour A&E target, um, the cancer standards, which guarantee you to see a specialist within two weeks of a referral from your GP, um, the 18 week target for the length of time you wait from referral by your GP to getting an operation. All of these standards were sort of politically very pertinent and very strong. And so every part of the country is completely focused on meeting those standards and not getting into trouble from the center uh, if they failed them. And so what happens is they nick money out of mental health to make sure that they meet those uh, politically resonant mental uh, 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 access standards. And, you know, it results in mental health always losing out. And so my view was you need to have the same rights to access treatment on a timely basis in mental health as you do in physical health, particularly when we know that intervening early with mental health uh, aids recovery. And, and you get better outcomes if you intervene quickly. So, uh, you know, there's a strong evidence base to support what I've been arguing for. Um, we started the process of introducing those standards, but there's a long way to go and it hasn't happened yet. You know, progress has slowed, sadly. Um, so, you know, once you leave the department, there's nothing you can do. It's in the hands of others. And I don't think there was the same interest or commitment to introducing those standards after that. Yeah. And I think what you're saying about um, early intervention being like so important in uh, treatment and recovery and just in general mental health. Another thing that I think is something that's important we talk about. And I think um, with people like yourselves and, and uh, people talking about their own personal experiences and not being shy about it is, is yeah. really important. So I think it would be interesting to hear um, from the perspective of someone that I guess has been around a bit longer than us, um, how you think perceptions around uh, mental health and stigma have changed um, over your, your career and I guess your lifetime. Yeah, so I, I should incidentally make one important proviso to um, this sort of the case for early intervention. Um, what we must also guard against is over pathologizing. You know, we should not over medicalize. Um, I think often someone experiencing mental ill health, if you can uh, provide them with support, which may, be, may, may well be social support, you know, joining a choir, uh, getting to know other people, going for walks in beautiful countryside, playing football, whatever it might be, doing art, music. Uh, these are the things that make life worth living. And, you know, uh, so we, we have to avoid sending someone to a clinic um, as the automatic response to every mental health challenge. Uh, but that 
early support is critical. <clears throat> um, now I can't remember the question you asked. It's just about like kind of stigma and how yeah. it's changed. So, um, so I think I think as a society we're on a journey. Um, I think we've made significant progress over the last decade. Um, I think the time to change campaign, which tragically the, it's just been announced the government is ending the funding of, um, so it will end. Uh, but that campaign, which has ended up with a lot of people in the public eye, people in sport, in music, in business, in politics, talking about their own mental ill health. I think that's been incredibly important in changing perceptions. Um, and I think, you know, um, uh, the, the work, I mean, what I tried to do in the department when I was a minister about constantly advocating for mental health within government, hopefully that played a part in getting it much more on the map. Um, uh, but I think I call it the unfinished revolution. There's a long way still to go. And, you know, it's, a, it's actually a global uh, um, campaign or effort. Um, around the world, many countries still discriminate against people with mental ill health in their laws. So in many countries, not just the developing world, uh, there are laws which prevent you from buying property, from entering a contract, from getting married, if you have significant mental health uh, issues. Now, you know, in our country, we've eradicated those laws now, um, but we have to remember they still exist for many people around the world. So I think there needs to be a, you know, it's a global human rights campaign for equal rights for people who experience mental ill health. Um, and then there's a danger then of, to say, well, we've sorted ourselves out here. Uh, well, we have in so far as the law is concerned. But then you look at practice and just to give you an example, the Care Quality Commission uh, about a year and a half ago uh, produced a report which said that there are 3000 beds in what are wonderfully called locked rehabilitation wards. So these are wards in mental health hospitals, private and public, um, where people are supposedly there for rehabilitation, but they're locked up and the Care Quality Commission made the point that um, for many of those people, they, there was no need for them to be locked up. Now, that is clearly a human rights abuse. How can you lock someone up? They haven't committed a crime. Uh, it, this is outrageous in uh, age. And then you also think about the use of the Mental Health Act, which in itself uh, uh, involves far tougher um, rights of the state to detain people um, against their will. And what happens uh, is that those laws impact disproportionately on young black men. So uh, there's a really troubling issue here, which has not been really put into the public domain properly yet. But the mental health system, in my view, discriminates against uh, young black men in particular. Uh, and now the argument in, against me on this is, yes, but if young black men are experiencing psychosis and uh, for their own uh, safety need to be detained, we have to do that. But that's not good enough. We have to understand much more about why this is happening. What is it about their circumstances that results in them being uh, detained against their will, which, of course, then results in a loss of trust in those communities? Uh, and so in my trust in the South London Maudsley, we will commit to a, uh, a, a real effort to change this, to address these um, uh, inequalities uh, in the system. So, you know, it's a long answer, I'm sorry, but this is an unfinished revolution in our attitudes and our behaviours as a society towards people with mental ill health. And the same goes for people with a learning disability and people with autism. Thanks very much for that. That was a, a very insightful opinion that you have there. Um, 
I d we just wanted to ask next, I mean, in, in relation to your job, your, your role as chair, um, it must be quite stressful. And especially if you're campaigning for long periods of time and you're working very hard, sometimes those things don't always perhaps go the way you would like. Does this stress ever impact your mental well-being? And if so, how do you deal with this impact? How do you manage it? Well, I don't think I've uh, ever myself experienced diagnosable mental ill health, depression or anxiety or or anything else. Uh, and I'm fortunate in that regard. Um, I've explained that it has touched our family in other respects. Um, but, you know, we're all affected by stress and anxiety in one way or another, and it may affect our sleep um, or it may impact you in other physical ways as well. And I'm quite sure that over the years I have uh, suffered some of the consequences of anxiety or uh, stress uh, manifested in a physical way. Uh, but um, Thankfully, nothing that hasn't been uh, that's been, you know, everything that I've experienced has been manageable. Um, but I'm acutely aware that, you know, um, uh, this the job that I do uh, can be immensely challenging. It can sometimes feel like wading through treacle backwards. Um, you know, you I'm impatient for change um, and get frustrated with the inertia um, that sometimes exists in the NHS. Um, but, um, you know, if there is a cause worth fighting for, then you keep going. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, going on from that and thinking about kind of uh, the current circumstances of uh, COVID-19, I mean, it's affected everyone differently. And, and as we've talked about, kind of um, social activities being more important than ever and isolation being a, a problem. Um, how would you say COVID has impacted you the most? Well, I'm sitting at home looking at you at a, on a screen in front of me. And um, so, you know, uh, for months on end, I was just in my study here, you know, in front of a screen constantly. In September, I managed to get back to London and, you know, actually doing physical visits, meeting people, which was great. Um, uh, but now with the rates rising again, uh, everyone was sort of instructed to return to working from home. Um, but I think, look, here's the thing with COVID. Uh, the disproportionate impact of COVID is, for me, really striking. So if you uh, are financially secure, uh, which I am and my, you know, our family is fortunate enough to be, um, then you're fine. Um, and in some ways, having this period of time where, you know, for months on end, I never got out of a pair of shorts. And, uh, you know, I, I, working from home, I saw more of Mary than I had done in 36 years of marriage. Uh, and it was good. Um, and then you think about someone who's, you know, in a tower block in Peckham, for example, um, who might have screaming children, who might have no space to um, get exercise, uh, who may be worried about the loss of a job or may have no job. Um, and you imagine the nightmare that some people are going through, the anxiety about the future. Um, so this, this, this sort of differential impact is extraordinary. And uh, it's not just we're all suffering and some are suffering more than others. Some are positively benefiting and others are in a state of complete nightmare. Uh, and and it accentuates the uh, the divide in society. Tragically, it will have a bigger impact on children from poorer backgrounds in terms of their education attainment. Um, uh, there will be some children who, through lockdown who've experienced, you know, witness domestic violence. We've, we know there's been an uptick of domestic violence, worryingly so. Um, children often experience that. That's a trauma that you go through in childhood that, that has consequences, I'm afraid. Um, and 
and, and then, you know, it has a disproportionate impact on some ethnic groups as well. And I just think that as we hopefully finally emerge from this, um, we try and uh, rebuild society in a way that recognises the uh, impact that it's had on uh, uh, more disadvantaged people and try to build back a, a fairer society. And, it, you know, that's a, that's a big aspiration uh, and it's easy to say it, but we need to do better than we have done hitherto. And, and perhaps, um, perhaps the the last question we are to ask you have just answered. Yeah. But <laughs> done it again. Sorry. Uh, is there any message that you would like to send to those watching? Any take home message that you have for them? Well, um, so I, so the, the Hedgecake uh, initiative, I think, is brilliant. Um, the work. It's been done. I think UEA TV is involved as well. Um, I think raising money for this support is vitally important. Uh, you know, the tragedy is we've lost students to suicide um, over the years, uh, including at Norwich. And uh, that imposes a moral obligation on all of us to do better. Uh, and I got quite heavily involved in the zero suicide movement, which started in, in, in the United States in Detroit. But it's the, at its heart, it's a sort of view that we need to be much more audacious about saving lives. Um, we've managed to reduce globally the death rate through heart disease, through stroke, through HIV AIDS. The, the, the line on the graph is consistently down in all those disease areas uh, in suicide the line is like that there's no progress being made and yet and yet we know um, we have the evidence of things that we can do that reduce the risk of suicide and I'm afraid it's a case of society and institutions not taking it seriously enough so you know, this initiative is one that I very strongly support uh, to both save lives, but also to help people have a more fulfilled life, a happier life. And and actually, you know, if we think about it, what is government? What should government be all about? Uh, what should people working in the public sphere be all about? Actually, surely it should be to help people to live happy, contented, fulfilled lives. Um, so. Uh, Good on you and thanks for everything you're doing. Thank you so much for joining us, Sir Norman Lamb. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And I think we've only just kind of scratched the surface. And I think there was so much more that we could have discussed with you. Some some things that you said really resonated with me. And yeah, just thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope that we'll maybe get to catch up with yeah. you sometime in the future. That would be good. That would be very good. And good luck with everything you're doing and your future careers and all the rest. Yes. And just thank you as well. We're really pleased to be supporting the the children young people well-being norfolk fund as well that's great then it's been really great to follow all of the work that you've been doing so thank you so much brilliant thank, thank you, you. Thanks. thanks a lot Very much bye-bye bye-bye bye. Bye. i think, I think we, we are back, back. we are back I'm um, so, so hi guys, guys. Um, um, that, that was, was such a good interview, interview. Um, 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 it, was it was so important, important to watch that, I hope you all enjoyed it, it. And thank, thank you so much, much to Sam and Sam, Sam, Sam for, for coming, coming and helping us out with that, with that. Um, um, that. we really appreciate you giving us time, you're a really busy man, man. Um, um, right, so just a quick review before we move on, we'd just like to mention that we are doing a giveaway, so we've just got some small prizes, during the live during stream, the live you stream. could um, go onto our Facebook um, and share the live stream that we're doing and use the hashtag mental health 24 live. So it will be hashtag MH 24 live and tag us as well so that we can see that you've done it. And you'll be in with your chance to win some kettle chips and popcorn packages. Um, 
and they're yeah just a little snack pack basically um we'll dm the winners so that we can arrange to get the um, packages to them either deliver them or post them or whatever so there'll be two prizes for the people that do it um quickly as possible and there will be another prize as well for someone if they interact with us really well doing the live stream best person um to get involved and um, we'll be giving a prize to them as well um so that's great i'm going to put the instructions on the event page now and also on our story on facebook so check it out if you are interested um and that would be great so next we have uh, another interview um from earlier this month in this one's with the director of student services john sharp and he's going to be talking about mental health support on campus and also the courage pro project so we will see Hello, um, I'm about to interview John Sharp, who is the Director of Student Support Service, Student Support, um, Student Services right now, isn't it? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, thank you very much for coming on, John, um, firstly. Um, I, I, just, to, just to kind of get us started, um, could you tell us a bit more about yourself and what your role is at UEA? Yeah, absolutely. So I been at UEA for almost forever, it feels, um, 26 years, I mean, my 26th year. So started back in the mid 90s and I've probably been in pretty much every administrative professional services type role that there is on my way to the role I'm currently in. So started out doing school administration then school manager role then a faculty manager role then i was in learning and teaching services um i've worked in schools in every faculty i've done schools in health schools in arts and humanities schools in science schools in social sciences so that's been really useful in terms of the new role as director of students i guess isn't post because each faculty and each school have very different atmospheres, very different issues that the students in those schools might be facing. So I think it's really helpful to have been here for quite some time before moving into my new role, which essentially is looking after all of the different things that student services try and provide to our students. OK, and what kind of support is available through those services. I'm aware there's quite a variety. Do you want to talk us through them a bit? Absolutely. So I am very much a uh, keep it simple sort of person. So we break student services down into two large areas, well-being and then life and learning. They're the areas people are really aware of. But before turning to those, it's worth mentioning to students, we do have a dental practice that is part of student services. So if you're struggling to find a dentist, get in touch um, with the dental practice on campus. Um, and it's unusual because it's not an it's not a practice that operates on our site. It actually is part of student services. So nominally, at least I manage the dentist, although I have no dentistry experience. Um, so don't let me try and fix anyone's teeth. Um, so that's one that people aren't always aware of is, is part of student services. We also look after all of the faith provision on campus. So we have the faith center that's at the top of the stairs near the main square. We have the daily Islamic prayer facility, which is in the big lecture theater building. And then also for Islamic Friday prayer, we have a large space in Blackdale. So that's the faith provision, which for students is a important part of maintaining their well-being and mental health is their engagement with their particular faith or belief and then going to the two large groups we've got life and learning and that breaks down as you might expect into life and learning so on the learning side we have a learning enhancement team and they can provide support to people who are maybe struggling with certain aspects of their study whether it's how to revise how to put an essay together what does it actually mean to do library-based research but they also support students with specific learning difficulties um students with dyspraxia dyslexia dyscalculia 
Um, they've got a range of tools and will also offer group sessions and individual sessions to students. So, and although that's learning support, actually that really impacts on people's well-being as well. If I'm really struggling because I keep procrastinating and I don't know why it is I keep putting things off until the night before the essay's due, I can spend some time with someone from the learning enhancement team and fix that issue my well-being is going to be greatly improved as well as my ability to get my work done in a more structured way. Then on the student life side, the student life teams can support students with financial concerns, international students with visa related concerns, but also all of those general life issues that may not be of a type where somebody feels that they need a professional well-being advisor or counsellor or therapist to engage with them. It could be something like I'm struggling to get on with the other people in my flat. Um, I'm feeling a bit homesick and I'm not quite sure what to do about that. Um, or it could be practical things, particularly right now during the situation we've got with COVID and the impending lockdown. It could be questions about how do I actually use an online delivery service? <laughs> how do I go about making that work for me? So that's our life and learning. And then the wellbeing team, we've got a team that supports students with disabilities. Um, so a team of disability advisors, they can help people make sure they get the right reasonable adjustments. They can help people apply for what's called DSA funding, which is money you can get from the government. If you need particular equipment, for example, you might need someone to take notes for you. Um, and then we have a large team of mental health and well-being advisors and a whole talk therapy team. And we can offer person-centered counseling, other forms of counseling, CBT, which a lot of students find really helpful. So we don't just offer one model. So we try and work out with the student if therapy is appropriate, what is going to be the most appropriate therapy. And then I think really importantly, because we have to recognise that it's part of seeing that mental health is as important as physical health. So the example I often use when talking to academics about what we do is if we had a student who was diagnosed with a serious kidney condition, the university would provide them with emotional well-being support because that would be a big diagnosis to receive. They might need some learning help. They might need some financial assistance. But we wouldn't try and do the dialysis for them if they needed that, because that needs medical input. And people can see that because we're used to seeing physical health as really significant. We need to recognise that mental health issues are absolutely as important and as significant. So the university can provide support and advice and guidance. But a big part of what we try and do is signpost students to the right service within the NHS. And that might be at a very significant end. It might be about getting in touch with what's called the crisis team for people who are really struggling right now with their mental health. It might be about just explaining to people how the NHS system works, because that could be quite difficult to navigate or making sure that a student can get seen by the GP service that's on campus when they need to be seen. We can do what's called a 72 hour referral. So if somebody is really struggling and they really need to be seen. We can't do that diagnosis or treatment, but we can help them get seen when they need to be seen. So it's a really big range of services. Um, other things that have come on very recently that are worth mentioning specifically, we have what's now called the embedded teams. So the embedded teams operate or were designed to operate physically within the faculty spaces. Now, due to COVID, they are online alongside everything else being online. But the idea is if you've got, you're, sometimes students are not sure even if they've got concerns. It's that space of, I might be okay, but I'm feeling a bit worried about some stuff and I'm not quite sure what to do with it. They can contact the embedded team. The links are on our web pages. They can either go to one of the regular drop in sessions that they run or have a specific appointment with one of the embedded advisors 
and they can talk to them about a whole range of concerns they might have, whether it's about struggling to engage with their studies, their concern about their well-being. What the embedded team can do is either support that student through that process or if the needs are more significant, they can refer them then into what we're now thinking of, if you like, as our central well-being team. Because it might be that that embedded advisor says, actually, I think you might really benefit from some counselling, for example, or actually it'd be really useful for you to sit down with one of our disability advisors because you might be able to get some funding to help you with this particular issue that you're facing. So they're really important. And then for students living on campus, we have our residential life team. And there are two layers to that. We have what we call our student services residents, which is a bit of a mouthful, so we say SSRs. Um, some universities call them wardens. They're generally PhD sort of level students who are living in accommodation alongside other students. They can provide sort of low level, you might think of it as that low level pastoral support. So we're not expecting them to deal with somebody who's in crisis. Um, we're not expecting them to provide ongoing care and support to a student, but it's about someone who you can go and talk to. But the other thing they can do, and they do do really well, is try and build that sort of feeling of your flat being a social unit that you all know each other you can all get on with each other you can all talk with each other and as we enter this new lockdown period that's going to be more important than ever that within people's bubbles that you know we are helping to foster really good and positive relationships so that's a fairly rapid run through because yeah from when i started three years ago we now offer a really wide range of services to students, and we need to. Thank you very much for that overview. For anyone who was watching that, and if you want to go back and rewatch it, uh, what John just said, if any of those things are of use to you, then please do. Um, we'll be posting this video up at the end of the live stream along with everything else, so it's all there. Um, I'm going to run forward a bit through the questions, John, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Something something I hear from other students is that sometimes the the live stream we're doing is kind of to raise fundraising money basically um, for Nightline, which is a student run listening service. Uh, and something I hear from students is sometimes they're quite surprised to learn that Nightline is not part of the student services. Um, what what do you think are the benefits of having a service such as Nightline? How is it different to student services? Okay, so Nightline is, the first thing I say is Nightline is hugely important. If a Nightline organisation didn't already exist as a national organisation with units in most universities now and as something that's historically been funded by student unions and by the fundraising efforts that you have to do yourselves to get enough money to really provide the service you need to provide, if that weren't in place, universities would have to do it. That's how important it is. Um, however, that wouldn't be ideal. And the reason it wouldn't be ideal is students know when they phone Nightline that they're speaking to another student. They know they're not speaking to a member of staff. And even though no member of student services staff if a student phones up and says, I'm going through a horrible guilt spiral because I plagiarised a piece of work three weeks ago, student services aren't then going to phone up the school of study and say, well, I've just found out the student X plagiarised. Nonetheless, students will have some issues that they feel more comfortable talking to a fellow student about. So that's really important. And because of that, the funding is important because if it were delivered by students and run by students, but funded by the university. For some students, they might think, hmm, so does that mean the university is directing their agenda? Are they really as independent as they might otherwise be? And that would be a concern. I think the other thing is that a Nightline is a listening service. It's not a guidance service. It's not an advice service. And you need that because there are times in anyone's life where 
They don't want someone to be a solutions person. They don't want to phone someone up and that person says, oh, you need to do this. You need to do this. Have you thought about X? They just want to talk and have someone to listen. And that's what Nightline does. And it does it, I think, in the best possible way when it's independent and crucially when it's well funded. So for me, if there ever came a time when the student union nationally was not funding Nightline or wasn't sufficiently funding Nightlines around the country, I think universities would at that point need to find a way of providing some funding, working with those organizations potentially to help them with fundraising activities using our development teams but always maintaining that independence because another thing that nightline does and it does it very effectively and it's not something people necessarily hear about is nightline people meet with student services people and they can say to us we think you need to do more of this and why is it that you're not doing x right now because we're getting a lot of calls about that um, never ever sharing individual details of calls that would never happen and couldn't happen but it's that sort of feedback loop and being independent they can hold our feet to the fire in a way they wouldn't be able to if funding was dependent on 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 us so independence really important and the service is hugely valuable right thank you for that i'll move on to my next question now um which is uh, what, what are student services currently doing to help students through the additional challenges faced by the COVID-19? That's a really good question. Um, I'll, I'll, I, was, I would start it off by saying a lot. Um, it's, it's been the busiest certainly I've ever been um, in 25 years. And I think it's been the busiest that my staff have ever been. And that's with the additional investment that we've had. So I think the whole university in terms of the staff of the university are trying to pull together to make sure that we make this experience as positive as we can make it for students. I know most universities are using lines in their, their sort of literature to students about this year might be somewhat different to normal. Um, and you see it in the news all the time, people saying it, it's a bit of a different year this year. Um, one of the things I always try and do is be really frank. I, I don't think that covers it remotely. It's a shockingly unprecedented year for everybody globally. Um, the potential impact on people's well-being and their mental health, if someone has an underlying condition, can be hugely significant. Um, somebody has very low level agoraphobia, let's say. Um, but they're in an environment where they're, they're going out regularly. You then have a lockdown situation like the one we had back in March where they can't go out. Then when suddenly they can again, that can be that much harder to think, right, now I can go out, so I will go out. Um, people new to a university environment, the spaces where you can form friendships outside of, say, your course group or your flat group, become slightly more limited so what we've tried to do as a university as a whole is while staying within the law and making sure we do everything in a way that's covid safe is to try and create social spaces so we've had those two big tents people have probably seen on campus that we've been putting events on we had the circus at the start of the year that people may have gone to apparently was was great i couldn't get a ticket so I don't know, but it sounded fantastic. We had the big light show that was up and around campus early in the year. So trying to put things on on a big level that make the experience enjoyable. Then at the level of, say, if we think about flats, um, how do we help flats sort of cohere as groups? Because you're spending much more of your time in that flat. That was the thinking behind putting the... Um, what they call the the HD projectors into the kitchens so that you can watch a movie together and project it onto the wall. And that makes for a more social experience than everybody sitting in their own bedroom watching Netflix on their laptop screen. So that was something we put some money into as a university because it was something we could do that would promote people getting together in a safe way and doing something quite social. Um, 
Then you get into, but what about the individual experience? What do we do where somebody is just finding this all a little bit of a struggle? And there, what we did back in March, we moved all of our services online in a week. Um, and we were up and running within that week. And I would say to any student who's experiencing any kind of concerns or worries or just needs some support to get in touch with us. People sometimes think I don't want to trouble student services because my problems aren't as significant as this hypothetical other person. And whatever you're dealing with, if it's significant to you, it's significant. So get in touch with us and we have capacity. We can support students and we're really keen to hear from you. You can get in touch with us online. There's a phone number on there as well. You can get in touch with us through that. Um, you can either use our general online referral form if you're not sure where that support that's best for you might sit or you can go directly to the embedded team or directly to a well-being appointment request. So that's our general support. And, but it is COVID related because a lot of the contacts we're now getting from students are about just finding this year really tough. And then the big issue is, and what about when people have to self-isolate? Um, you can go onto the university's website now and see a running tally of how many students we have <clears throat> who have tested positive for COVID. But what you have to consider is most people are living in a flat with, say, eight to 12 other students. So that's a tenth of the story. One person tests positive, that's 10 to 12 people going into self-isolation for two weeks. If then partway through that period, one more of them then test positive, that could be another two weeks. And that's really tough for people. So we've put together a specific COVID support team, not an imaginative title. Um, again, it does what it says on the tin. And what those teams are doing is they are getting in touch with people when they need to self-isolate, telephoning people, checking in with how people are. And some people say, actually, I'm fine. It's it's two weeks. I'm, I'm sorted. I've got my food. I've got my toiletries. I've got Netflix. They might be a really keen gamer and think I've now got an excuse to just just game. Um, some people, on the other hand, have not got easy access to online food deliveries. They might be concerned that they were planning to do their bed laundry that weekend and now they can't for two weeks. So what are they going to do about that? They've run out of towels. Um, there can be all sorts of issues. And what the COVID support team can do is work with those students and make sure that they feel properly supported around those practical issues. So, for example, we have managed to order in, you'd be amazed at the sorts of things that everyone wants to buy right now. But if people are struggling to get bed linen, for example, we can provide that. If people are struggling to get a food delivery and they're in self-isolation, we can provide them with a number that they can call that will then allow them to get a priority code. It's only with a limited number of supermarkets, but that will mean they will get their food delivery. And worst case scenario, they don't have the means right now to pay for food delivery. There's another service run through the local council that we can put students in touch with who will provide them with essentially a free initial food package. So there are, there's some real practical things that we can do. And then where I think student services comes into its own in this is it's it's the well-being support. So our uh, student service residents at SSR teams where people live on campus will be in touch through WhatsApp neighborhood chats to offer flat support, offer individual support. The COVID support team will be checking in with people who are self-isolating and where someone is really struggling with that um, or even just struggling a bit. You don't have to be really struggling. It might be that to get them through that, they need quite a regular check in. It might be that it brings up an issue for them. And so we need to refer them in for some support through our talk therapy team. But the key is keeping that contact going, keeping in touch with people and being led by the students in terms of what is it that they 
need or would like. And that's not going to make those two weeks easy. But if we can make them run as smoothly as possible, then that's something we should and also want to be doing. Yeah, that's that's great support there. Um, we've talked a lot about kind of student support so far and student well-being, um, which kind of brings me on to my next questions from that is UEA staff, a lot of them are working remotely and might have their, their own problems to deal with. Um, firstly, how do you support your colleagues and promote good mental health and well-being in the workplace? And, you know, secondly, in your role, it might be quite stressful at times. And what do you do to maintain your own mental well-being? Ah, so in terms of staff, so for staff generally in the university, we have something called Health Assured, which is, is what's known as an employee assistance programme. Um, and it's basically you access it through a web page, but you get through to real human beings. You can... So someone who is struggling with the current COVID situation, they can speak to somebody. They've got teams of counsellors. If people are dealing with a sort of more long-term issue, they can provide financial advice. We know uh, UEA is generally a good employer. We pay the living wage, for example. But nonetheless, if I'm working at UEA, but my partner may have been the main earner and because of COVID, they now don't have work. Um, the Health Assure platform can provide financial advice, it can provide debt advice. So there's a range of services for staff. And interestingly, just coming back to students, that platform is also available to students. So it's just another line of support. Um, the link to the web page is in the student services web pages, and it's fairly well flagged up. So that's another route for students as well. And it's it's the same provider for both staff and students, which I think is nice because it's treating us as a community. So that's what the university provides. What I have done um, is a few things. Um, one, lots of offers of buying actual cake for staff when we're finally out of lockdown. Usually when we have a an all staff meeting which i try and do with my service at least two or three times a year and that's with 100 and odd staff now so it's a big meeting and inevitably the question of when are we getting cake comes up so within a week of each meeting there's, there's cake i have to bring cake in which at the moment i can't do so i've been promising virtual cake alongside that we've had sort of virtual coffee mornings i'm about to introduce a sort of a drop-in Q&A session for staff as an alternative to sort of the more social. Maybe people have got not just wanting to chat with colleagues, but maybe they've got some concern questions. So I'm just going to be making myself available for that. So people are going to ask things. Um, and again, they know they'll get a frank answer. Most importantly, March, April, May, everybody was working really, really long hours. Um, and then, of course, you get to June and July and everybody is still working really, really long hours. And there comes a point where, as a director of the service, you have to, instead of directing people in terms of what to do, you have to start directing people to stop. So I have been very, very clear and said, there are grades where a certain amount of overtime is reasonable, and that's okay, but you are not to work silly hours. You've got to stop. You've got to have a healthy work-life balance and you maybe have to make that happen for yourself because if you're working at home, it's so easy because there's no commute to just sit there for an extra hour, an extra two hours. And before you know where you are, it's nine o'clock and you're still doing emails. It's not good for the individual staff member and it's not actually good for the students that we're trying to support because we won't be at our best if we're not getting a decent amount of downtime. And then... In terms of what I myself do, um, I'm quite quite a nerd um, in that I really like board games. So lots and lots of board games. Um, I also do solitaire war gaming. Yeah, um, it's all exciting in my household. And then, of course, painting little miniatures to then play those games with. So I find that a great way to de-stress. I think the key thing is 
everybody at this point, I think, needs something that they just enjoy. So musical instruments, for example, are great. But if you play a musical instrument, you're probably practicing and trying to get better. So there's an element of work in it. I think everyone needs to find something that is just relaxing, that there's there's nothing they need to achieve. There is almost no point to what they're doing. I suppose that's it. Some pointless activity that's just fun. Um, we all need a bit of fun at the moment. I encourage my staff to try and find something in the day that's fun. And I think as students, students should be doing that too. You heard it first, a pointless activity that's fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you haven't got one, find it. <laughs> and kind of beside that, a lot of people, as we know, have been struggling this year beyond the uh, the pointless fun. Do you have any other advice or tips on how to cope? Yeah, so... Uh... There are, there's a whole load of things I could say, but I know we've only got so much time. So I think in, in order of importance, we hear a lot of messages about being kind to each other. And that's really important. People need to also apply that to themselves. It's something I keep saying to staff. We all need to be kind to ourselves. Um, it's a really tough time this year. And that might be, I don't know, if someone's on a bit of a health kick um thinking actually do you know what i'm gonna give myself a day off um it might be realizing that it's hard to work right now it's hard to study right now um we aren't just studying and working from home or studying and working remotely that's only part of it what we are doing is living through a pandemic whilst also trying to work and study and if we always remind ourselves that that's our context, we can then be a bit more forgiving of ourselves if it takes us a bit longer to write something, to read something, if we just need a bit more downtime than we might normally need. So being kind to yourself, really important. Um, finding ways to keep in touch with the people that you can't physically visit, I think is really, really important. If you, know, if you can't visit your nan for the next month, but they've got a mobile phone and maybe they've not used WhatsApp before. Ring them up and get get them on WhatsApp. Um, because you, your family interactions, for people who've got close relationships with their family, that can be really, really important to help people get through things. The third thing I would say, and this goes against my pointless fun, um, you need some of that, but the other thing is, weirdly, I think we're all in this contradictory position of when we're busy with stuff, it feels like we have less time than we've ever had before. And then when we're not engaging directly with something, because we're spending time in our bedrooms, in our homes, it feels like there's more time than ever before and it passes really slowly. So I'd say find something you've always wanted to learn, something you've always wanted to develop an interest in, and make sure you give that a couple of hours a week, which could be an instrument. It could be just getting really good at a particular game. And then my other tip, yeah, a bit of just having some fun, really important. And just to be sort of um, not a doom merchant, but a cautionary note as well, um, when I say some sort of pointless fun thing, I think it's that's not going to generate its own problems for you. So the biggest temptation for many people in this sort of situation is really easy just to think I'll have a nice drink or some other recreational substance. And if you're not in a pub, it's not measured. And if you're buying it from a supermarket, it's easier to buy lots. And those sorts of behaviours, there's nothing wrong with having a drink. Um, I'll stick to the drink aspect. Um, but it's really easy to, before you know it, think, oh, I'm doing that every night now. So I think my other top tip would be if there are things that you're doing that feel like it's making this situation easier, but at the back of your mind, you've got that nagging sense of maybe it's not ideal. Listen to that nagging sense. Talk to your friends about it. Have that conversation of, are we doing this a bit much? Uh, it's not to say don't don't ever have a drink, but just 
we know that it's one of the things that across the country people are doing more of as a result of the situation so if managing that will help you feel actually happier because we know that alcohol has a depressive effect that would be another really important tip and then lastly just promoting the service i guess as i've said before we are here to help you don't need to be going through some kind of crisis to use our services you don't need to feel i'm really struggling and if i don't get some help i don't know if i'll be able to stay at uni if you think any of our services might be able to be helpful get in touch because we'd love to be able to help thanks very much and to my last question that might have been the message you were looking for but is there any final take-home message you want to give to those who are watching yes everything i just said plus given the topic of this do not forget that nightline is there for you as well um it's a brilliant service a couple of years ago there was um a mock nightline which i took part in where we took they weren't actual calls it was nightline people who knew the sorts of calls that they deal with ringing in and i took a couple of calls and i would say it's one of the hardest things i've ever done um so the first thing i think i'd like people to take away from this is not only is nightline a really important service but the people running and volunteering and taking part in your nightline service are really well trained they do a fantastic job it's a really difficult job and they do it all voluntarily which is amazing so do use that service it's there for you and it's a great service and as and when there's fundraising activity by nightline i would urge everybody to think well i could probably have one less whatever that item might be one less coffee one less pint one less chocolate bar whatever it might be because nightline does get funded through the student union but we know student unions nationally don't have huge amounts of funding and if there is a service that students are providing to students that we all need to support as much as we possibly can nightline is that service because it could help your friend stay at university or make the right decision rather than the wrong decision when things are tricky or just make them feel okay about socializing and engaging with you as their friend so even if you've never used nightline somebody you know probably is and really values it thanks very much john uh, we'll end the interview there um but i'd just like to say a thank you to coming in and taking the time out of your day to be involved with the live stream and uh, again i just reiterate your point about nightline it, it is there no matter how big or how small the problem same as what you've said with student services it is there to listen it's there to be used by students um thanks very much and no, thank you for having me really appreciate the chance to come on lovely thank you goodbye now bye I hope you guys all enjoyed that and found it really useful. Um, again, thank you um, to uh, the Director of Student Services for the interview. Um, we're going to transfer over to a little um, quick baking um, segment by Angela Lee, who is a fourth year medical student. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy that. I'm Angela, I'm a fourth year medical student. I'm fairly into my fitness and healthy eating. Today I'm going to be showing you how to make some fluffy souffle pancakes with some protein powder added into it. So for these pancakes, what you'll need is some flour, two eggs, some protein powder. I've got a mixture of almond and soy milk just because I am running out, but you can use any milk. Here I'm adding in 25 grams of protein powder, 25 grams of flour, and 50 grams or 50 millilitres of almond milk. 
Then separate the two eggs, egg whites, into a separate bowl and egg yolks into the main mixture. Here I'm whisking the egg whites until soft peaks. If you have electric whisk, I recommend you using that, but this is a good arm workout. This is the consistency it should be. I forgot to show you guys that um, I added in one teaspoon of baking powder as well. Then I just mix the egg yolk flour mixture together. And next I fold in the egg white mixture in. I fold in a little bit at first just to make sure it's well incorporated and then I'll add in the rest of the egg whites. When you're folding this in just make sure to do it gently so that you don't get rid of too much air. Next you'll need to make the tin foil moulds. So here I'm just grabbing some tin foil, folding it half and half again around about three centimeters tall and then wrapping it around some round object just to mold it. Now it's time to fry them. I've heated up the frying pan on a medium heat and sprayed it with some oil so that they don't stick. Once you've spoon the batter in, I'd recommend turning it down to a low heat and then cooking them on each side for five minutes each. I forgot to show me flipping them because it was quite a hard process. But here's a big reveal, look at how fluffy they look. Now it's time to top them. I'm using some homemade lime curd and some frozen blueberries that I've microwaved so they've got a little bit of a sauce. But you can use anything to top them, I love maple syrup, biscoff spread or some Nutella. Let's do a taste test. And look at that fluffiness. And here's the finished product, my fluffy souffle protein pancakes. Hope you enjoy. Um, oh yeah, and I was introducing the next bit. Hi, so I think we're back. Uh, thank you so much to, An to Angela for um, the wholesome baking um, break that we had. Uh, right now we're going to have... Um, our next guest, who is Grace, she is the secretary for um, UEA Chase Tent Angels, and yeah, we're going to have a chat about mental health now. Marianne? Hi, Hi Grace. Hi, Anne. Yeah. Um, um, so, so for those, those that, that don't, don't know you, you um, would, would you like, like to just introduce, introduce yourself and um, sort of what, what you do? You do? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, so my name is Grace Arnold, um, I'm the secretary for Chase Sun this year. Um, essentially, I'm kind of running a lot of the admin for the club, um, but one of the benefits of having the whole COVID situation is we've had a lot more time to work on, on um, kind of extracurriculars to help our members. So we've introduced a role of mental health rep, um, which I kind of organ organised um, to get a few of our committee and coaches trained in mental health first aid, which I think was really important. Um, we've done a couple of seminars on um, racial inequality in sport uh, and stuff like that. So I'm kind of doing a bit of everything in the running of the club, really. So how long have you been involved in the club? Um, so this is my third year at uni. Um, in my first year, I was on committee as first year rep. Uh, last year, I didn't do anything. Um, and this year, uh, yeah, it's my first time being secretary. Uh, so three years at uni, hopefully another one next year if I don't fail. Um, but I think it's probably been the most formative part of my uni experience. Uh, I knew when I came to uni, I wanted to join and be a big part of it. So. Um, that's something I really look forward to and it definitely paid up to what I expected. 
So what motivates you to create this emphasis on mental health in the club? Um, I've had a lot of experiences um, struggling with my own mental health. Um, a lot of my friends and family have as well. Um, I, I don't think it's really talked about enough circle. Um, well, I know there are a lot of people struggling. Um, with my friends from sport and just the fact that I have a lot of conversations about mental health um, in my own time. I know some kind of discrepancies and when that's in like an academic sense and whether that's in um, kind of a sports sense. Um, I thought this is a position where I could have influence on changing something on a smaller level at uni um, and I should take that opportunity kind of where I could. Uh, like I'm not in the SU, you know, so um, I figured that was important to take advantage of. Um, but I think, yeah, to be, to be honest, it's, I think it's mostly because I've had my own um, struggles and my own experiences. Um, and I thought that what I kind of found out about how mental health is treated at uni um, and doing a lot of services myself, um, having another layer of help that people can very easily access uh, through a club that hopefully they feel comfortable in um, could benefit someone. I think I would probably benefit from that if it was there when I was in my first year and I was looking into accessing things like student services. Um, so that's pretty much why I wanted to do it is for myself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I know that we had a little bit of a collaboration with you earlier as well, where we did the mental health first aid training. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to tell us a little bit about that as well? Yeah, so uh, that was something that was, I think, incredibly beneficial. Uh, I know that everyone who did it from cheer has uh, really valued that and we're so grateful for Jamara from Student Services for uh, providing that for us. Um, essentially what it was was a two-day course um, essentially equating the kind of physical uh, health training you would do, so physical first aid, um, the same thing for kind of the most common um, mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, psychosis, um, eating disorders, um, to basically give our uh, committee and coaches a bit more confidence when discussing these things or when approached by a member um, struggling with those issues. Um, so we collaborated with Educate, and I, I got talking to um, Tori, the president, and she was lovely um, about introducing a role of mental health representatives within the club um, and how that could help our members and what she thought about it. Um, and then we both ended up kind of trying to find someone to provide this training. Um, I know I found someone else and Tori came back with someone better. Um, and then it it just it's worked out really well and I think it's opened a really important conversation of what can the uni provide because I think that's the thing is it shouldn't really be a case of um, you know students have to find those places for themselves to get that training um, but you also have to kind of look at it as well we're opening a conversation in a way with the university being like well you have this available um maybe it shouldn't be a thing we have to go and kind of search out ourselves and now they know that there's an interest and there's kind of a repeated interest because I, I think you guys are running um another training I know I've had several different people interested in that training um both from our club and from uh other clubs and societies so I think it's you know having like an kind of an official uh, qualification and an actual way of training yourself it it just really helps to make it more of an official thing that clubs should be worried about uh, just the same as we have a you know health and safety officer um, for you know uh, physical risk assessments and stuff like that uh, we should also be considering um, our own actions when it comes to how we're affecting 
uh, students' mental health and our our members and how we can support them in that, just the same as we're concerned about doing workouts for uh, their physical health. Um, so I think having like an official qualification and an official training and starting that conversation was really benefit beneficial in making at least our members within cheer stunt see that this is something we do take seriously and it's just as important to us as your physical health is amazing that's so good um so since um you've done the training and introduced these reps in your society um what sort of impact do you think that's had on on your club um so so far we haven't really done that much for it um i'm in the process of making um oh like can't remember the word um uh like collating resources um for different situations in which you might need support so how to signpost people to um student services um what specifically our mental health reps can offer um you know running a seminar on mental health and sport um and hopefully kind of getting the word out more about opening up a conversation within clubs um and you know hopefully branching out to to more sports clubs and collaborating with them on that um i think people being signposted to resources is something that we don't get enough as students um so i think if anything having that training happened it's opened a dialogue between us and the university um I hope, I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have a much more kind of official uh role that our members can uh use us for but i think there's um a little bit of a lack of clarity of what we can offer compared to what student services offer because a lot of people don't know what student services do offer um so i think the first point for us would be uh, establishing resources that help our own that we can provide to our members if they come and ask us that we can be like well here's an example of what I can do for you um because this is only like a few weeks ago that we've done this training so um kind of bring it forward as an official role I think we still need to hammer out the uh details of um but I th I'm hoping within itself by just by having the title um, we can kind of open that conversation and you know have a real real dialogue with the university about what resources there are and what would be most useful for us to signpost to our members and stuff like that um, and how maybe that could help the wider community not just sport as a community as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So since you started this whole process um, of raising more awareness about mental health in your club and other sports club, uh, what do you think was the most rewarding part of it? Um, I actually, I just found it personally rewarding to be in the actual training with so many people who are like-minded um and wanted to have that open conversation and open dialogue and you know when we were in the training even though we were over zoom or whatever um it was it was really just lovely and kind of affirming uh to see that there are so many people at uni that i wouldn't have interacted with otherwise um you know, we're all trying to further a conversation that isn't being had enough. Um, and I, I think if anything, the fact that we had, you know, more people interested in taking the qualification than we could actually provide um, at that time, that was rewarding for me personally because it opened my eyes to... The, the level at which people are, you know, concerned and people are wanting to um, improve 
as a whole the situation at uni. Um, so I think it's by getting a bit, I think we're just at the beginning of that, to be honest. Um, but I think it's really opened my eyes to the fact that we could be, make quite big changes at university, just starting from a smaller level. Um, Cause I think they, they do respond to students um and the fact that there's such a big kind of calling for this to be more widely available and for more people to take the qualification than we could offer it's been rewarding to see that i think that's big enough to make a real change um so moving forward what is one thing you think you'd really like to see happen within like the sports community um i think our first priority is to have this training available just as readily as the physical health training um that like that um real sport do offer mental health training um but it's nowhere near as in-depth as the physical health training is. And I understand, of course, it's sport. It's like physical health is what you're kind of prioritising that what you're there for. Um, but at the same time, in all aspects of university life, um, you know, sport, academic, social, mental health plays a part in every single thing. So... I, I think the fact that there are so many like student volunteers uh, who are quite involved with how the university runs and how the SU runs, um, just in terms of you know social life of so many students, um, the physical health of so many students, I think it's important for the university to recognise that mental health is just as key a player in people's lives as their physical health. Um, sometimes more uh, so you know kind of making that and a real official statement from the uni is being like well you have to have two members trained in physical first aid every year you also have to have two members trained in mental health first aid every year I think that would really go far in showing uh, students and showing the community that this is what they care about as well, like they, they care about our mental well-being just the same as our physical well-being because I think a lot of uh, students, like myself included, feel that that isn't said enough and from the university part they haven't made that quite clear enough or put down a strong impression. I don't think people don't want to, um, but I think maybe a kind of switching around some resources and just making that available um, and making that a thing that they they prioritise and that they clearly prioritise um, would be the most important thing for me personally. Lovely. Okay. And, and as um, Grace said, yeah, we've been talking about uh, mental health and um, kind of how it how we can kind of inter integrate the importance of mental health in sport. Um, yeah, we've been chatting. I think since around when MH24 was born in August and so they kind of concurrently happened at the same time while we organised mental health first aid training for the cheer stunt girls and some for some Hedgecate members as well and yeah Grace did tell me that there are like other sports clubs that are interested in the mental health first aid training so really important that we keep on um, trying to get that as you said more readily available um, we are hoping to run. We've got another session booked in in January, which we haven't released tickets for yet, but we've got that kind of booked in. Um, and yeah, I just I think me and Grace need to have a chat about sports and workshops around mental health and well-being because I think we might be doing a very similar thing at the moment, and so we might want to work together on that. But yeah, any last words, Grace? Um. I look forward to continuing to collaborate with you. Um, I think that what Hedgecate do are great. Um, I'm really enjoying being a small part of it this year. Um, I'm, I'm really glad that the conversation isn't going away and that if anything over 
you know, these more difficult times, uh, it's actually bringing to the forefront how important mental health is. Um, and I just hope that continues and we can do what we can to help people through it. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Grace, and make sure to watch some of the rest of the stream. And um, yeah, thank you for, for joining us. It was great to have a little chat. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. So what have we got next, guys? We have, I believe we have the Economics um, Society, who yes. are going to be talking a bit about mental health as well, I believe. Okay, so I'm Nicole and I'm studying marketing and I'm from UA TV too. And today I'm going to join with Rosie for our interview. So Rosie, can you introduce yourself about what is your major and why you want, why you joined the economy society? Mm -hmm, of course. Um, so I am a third year economics student now, in my final year, which is really scary. Um, and I joined the economic society in first year just because it was a way of meeting people. I didn't really know that many people on the course. It was just as a way of meeting people and I've sort of got stuck into it and now I'm the president. So, yeah, so it's just a really good way of everyone meeting each other and a bit more of a support group. And sort of I've had a lot of help from people through it. So, yeah, highly recommend anyone joining you or their respective academic society. Um, so it can just be quite helpful and a bit more support for everyone. So, yeah. Yeah, joining the is really good for students. Oh, so good, yeah. It's just doing something different outside of going to the lecture, spending time with your flat or whatever. And you know, it's just something a bit different and it can open people's eyes a bit. Because I feel like everyone sort of, in first year especially, you get sort of stuck and sucked into thinking that your flat are the only people to socialise with and stuff like that. And you don't necessarily get on with them that well. It's just just allows you to meet a lot more people and find the people who are actually your type of people. So, yeah. Yeah, so now we're going to talk about our main topic is about money and well-being. So the yeah. first question is in terms of economics, why do you think people feel stressed during the pandemic? There's so much going on at the moment. There's so much uncertainty. We've got very mixed messages from the government itself. We've got very mixed messages from um, financial reports and things like that. Some people are saying that it's going to be one of the worst um, recessions ever. And other people are saying that actually the economy's dealt with things quite well. And then we're opening back up the economy in July. Then now we're in another lockdown. It's just so much. And so it's honestly, it's just a bit mad. But I, I'm quite enjoying being an economic student at this moment in time. It's quite fascinating and hopefully we'll never see anything like this again. So, yeah, but there's just so much stress behind it. People are so uncertain whether, especially students, whether they'll be able to get a grad job or whether those opportunities will be there for them afterwards or internships and all things like that because companies effectively don't know where they're at. They don't know what the next six months holds. They don't know whether they'll be able to open for the entire time or whether they're going to have to shut down. So yeah, it's one of those. And even my, I had an internship over summer and that got canceled due to it because obviously we couldn't go in and all things like that. And it is stressful and people like putting themselves out into the job market or internships or just trying to find what path they want to go down to. You can't really do that a lot at the moment. I think that's what the main cause of stress is for students, especially because how are you supposed to be like, right, this is the job I want to do when you can't really get experience with it other than sitting online and speaking to someone, which is what everyone's job is looking like at the moment. So yeah, it's a bit of a stressful one, but hopefully it'll sort itself out and yeah. Oh yeah, but everyone's alone. Yeah. Everyone's in the same boat, yeah. And even just like speaking to my friends, like one of my friends had a massive breakdown about her career the other day. And I was like, don't you worry, we're all in the same boat. I've got no idea what I'm doing either. And people expect me to have an idea because I'm graduating this year and I should be good moving on to like 
big things, but I have no idea. And it's okay. It's absolutely fine to have absolutely no idea. <laughs> so, yeah. So, just want to elaborate more. So, how do you think the pandemic affects young people in terms of mental health? Massively. I think it's the first time that people have really had to think a lot about themselves because there's so many when you're in the outside world doing not normal well yeah normal things when we were back to how things were like a year ago now let's say you had so many distractions and there were so many ways that you could avoid sitting down and thinking about your life your mental health and all of those sorts of things whereas we've all been sort of catapulted even into it um, and we've suddenly got all this time just to sit and think. And I think that it's hit a lot of people really hard because no one's used to being that. No one's used to not having the usual support group. So it's really, I know for myself, it's impacted me massively. And like, even some things as like, some people can't go into therapy if they were seeing that before or getting a doctor's appointment to help with their mental health so much harder now. And, Everything is just so built up, but I do think one positive that's come out of this is people are talking a lot more about it. People are a lot more aware of it. Even over the past few days, I've seen a lot on shares on Instagram and Facebook and things like that of how to like support your mental health through the next lockdown and all things like that. So I do think that people are really talking about it a lot more and it's impacted probably it's impacted everyone, but young people definitely a lot because you sort of feel as though your your young years have been sort of put taken away from you and it I don't think that a lot of young people are necessarily as secure within themselves as say someone in their 30s are so having all this time to just think about your life is quite daunting so yeah um, but I do think that it's raised awareness for it but I feel as though a lot of people will suffer more for mental health issues as a result of it, which is understandable. Yeah. Yeah, I see. It. Mental health is a really popular topic these days. Yeah. Um, apart from mental health, how do you think about pandemic to change young people's future financial or career plans? Oh, it's going to affect everything. It's, there's just so much uncertainty. Like, a lot, I've seen a lot. There's been a lot of graduate jobs like posted and things like that, but. Some companies are holding back on doing that, that would usually be voting them. And there's just so much uncertainty. And for me, I will go into like a corporate job. I'll be like behind a desk for the rest of my life. Whereas I can only imagine what it would be like for other people saying, doing other degrees like, I don't know, art or English or a language where they would want to be like a, a translator or something and freelance. And that must be me so much more uncertain for them because I know that I'll always be needed to like write up about risk. Like I feel like I'm okay because that's what I want to go into. I want to go into the insurance industry and I feel like that's fine, but it must just be so uncertain for the people that don't necessarily have a direct path and don't know how much the pandemic is going to affect their industry. And it's just so daunting at the moment. However, I, I, will, um, I do think that the pandemic's opened a lot more opportunities for people like a lot of new businesses have started and it's really encouraged a lot of entrepreneurship and I've seen it all over and probably one of the biggest examples of it is on TikTok which I don't know if you use TikTok but everyone's always promoting their businesses on there and I feel as though it's really inspired people to be very creative with their ideas and maybe it's not necessarily their end goal career but people are finding other ways to do things and some of my friends have set up little businesses like making jewellery and things like that because they've got their spare time now. So it's just, it's quite, it's daunting and it has affected like what we originally thought was our plan for stuff. But I do think that a lot of people have taken the opportunity to come up with new ideas and be innovative. And a lot of businesses and a lot of industries are doing incredibly well out of this pandemic. So like um, food. Like everyone's ordering takeaways and all things like that. So there's so many opportunities within that. So, yeah, I do think that there are a lot of opportunities, but they're not necessarily, there are a lot of opportunities out there, but it might not be what you originally intended 
But if you can be flexible, then I feel as though everyone will get through it and there will be a bit more stability for them. And yeah. So you talk about the opportunities. So do you think that, do you think how uh, students, especially UA students, can size these opportunities? Yeah, definitely. Like, I think students, like, we are notorious for having a lot of free time. Like, I have six hours at uni every week. That's it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and yes, we have to do a lot of studies and people might have part-time jobs and all things like that. But we do have notoriously a lot of time so we can really put some effort into these things, as well as obviously looking after our mental health and seeing our friends, socialising, all things like that. But we do notoriously have a lot of time. Like, if there's something that is stressing you out about a future career or that, we have the time to sit down and plan it. And it is very stressful. And like seeing yourself in the, your future career or however is really stressful. But we have so much time and there's so many opportunities out there, even if it's just a part time job to like make money for now. Like delivery, they're doing incredibly well out of this pandemic. Everyone could get on their bike and do delivery. Well, not everyone. I couldn't do that myself because I actually don't own a bike and I wouldn't want to be out there in the cold. But there's those sort of opportunities out there. And there's a lot of opportunities for enterprise and all things like that. So although it is really uncertain and I feel like we need to draw whatever positives we can from it. So, yeah. Yeah, so there's many opportunities for the students. And can you give us one word? of wisdom or self-care advice um self-care I feel like this is what I always say to when I meet freshers I think it's important that everyone always before you comes to you come to uni tells you that oh it's the best years of your life you'll have so much fun and that's what everyone hears straight away but I for me and for a lot of people that I've spoken to and even people that have been to uni before me like me I had a conversation with her about it and she we were saying that it is some of the best times of your life and it will always be, but it also could be some of the worst and the most isolating and the most lonely times. So I think it's really important to know that it's not all going to be good. And I don't feel people emphasise that enough, really, because even in Freshers Week, everyone was saying, oh, you'll have so much fun. You can do this, that, the other. Think of all the people you meet. But for a lot of people, it takes them a long time to meet their people and some people don't even do that till say second year or things like that so I think that it's really important to like put out there that it will probably impact your mental health quite a lot you need to be strong and you need to be resilient and at the end of the day it will be all okay and yeah it will be some of the best times of your life but also probably some of the worst so yeah I think that's my little words of wisdom, that it's okay to feel like you're not living up to the the hype that is uni and it's okay not to feel like this is the best time of your life. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. I don't know if that's necessarily like the most positive message, but I feel like a lot of people ignore the fact of the impact it can have on you and you're thrown into being independent and all things like that and it's not necessarily all it's cracked up to be. And everyone has this imag- like this vision of what uni will be and all the great times you'll have. And it's not always like that for everyone. So, yeah. I think it's really important. Like, we need to tell people that they are not alone. Students and students exactly. uh, university or society, mm-hmm. they always give support to everyone. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of support out there. And even if you're just not seeking professional support, even just speaking to anyone, whether it be like I've put myself out there, if anyone in the society needs to have a chat, I'm happily well willing to do it. And I've like done some training with it and all things like that so that I can be as empathetic and as helpful as I can. So, yeah. There is help out there, and I think at the moment as well, everyone just needs to look after themselves and wait for it all to be over, and hopefully there'll be a vaccine soon. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah. So thank you so much, Emily, Thank you. Two weeks later, I'll end at 24.
so thank you so much to the Economic Society for getting involved um, with us. Um, they're so amazing and we are so glad to have been able to have them on board for our live stream. Um, so um, in a moment, we are going to be going to a short film from the Feminist Book Club Society and um, they're going to be talking about all things books, reading and mental health. Um, so that will be great. But just a quick reminder, first of all, um, we are um, sort of fundraising today and this whole event is for um, Norwich Nightline and we are trying to raise as much money as possible so they can keep doing all the amazing work that they do for the UBA and for Norwich. So if you are able to donate at all, then please go to the link. It should be above my head now um, on the screen and um, go and donate there. Um, but now onto the um, short film. To say that reading has changed my life would not be an understatement. I read a lot as a little kid, especially when I was unwell in year four. Reading has always been a major thing in my life, but it wasn't until lockdown that I realised how important it was for my mental well-being. Reading has helped me go through lots of difficult times in my life, including university, my first year, including during lockdown, and especially when I was a teenager. At the start of lockdown, I was so stressed, I was so sad, and I was so angry. But reading offered an escape from all of that and everything that was going on in the world. Yes, okay, it made me cry sometimes, but it was in a good way and it made me laugh and it brought me so much joy and admittedly it made me feel a bit warm and fuzzy inside sometimes. Reading helps us to find likeness, it helps us to see ourselves, but it also helps us to understand other people's stories. But the main reason, like I say, that, me that reading helped my mental well-being is that it offers an escape. It let me escape from any of my problems for 20 minutes to two hours, whatever. And that's why I love reading so much. And that's why I think it's so important for mental health. Being able to explore ourselves and others and understanding each other. It's a way to escape from the world for a little bit. And for that reason, reading will always have a very special place in my heart. Thank you so much for, this up for um, the short film. Next, we're going to move on to Isabella Stevens, who's going to um, share with us one of her art creations. Uh, the segment's called The Healing Power of Art. Um, we've got two portions to this segment as well, so we'll be followed by another one. But for now, um, we will show you um, Isabella's one. Um, she's going to show you her artwork and then talk through it as well. Um, so we hope you enjoy this quite a bit. I'm Isabella. I'm a member of Art Society. I'm also a year two psychology student. Um, I think my drawing and the quote is pretty nuanced. I don't like to say that art can only have uh, one meaning, um, but most obviously it's supposed to capture how we feel this constant need to be perfect, at least to those around us. Uh, in relation to the Oscar Wilde quote, the idea of uh, wearing makeup denotes how we want to live in this idealistic world we might see in, in certain films and books. Um, that is, we are trying to imitate art, um, but of course this doesn't really reflect reality where things aren't always as rosy. Um, therefore trying to be something or not, or in relation to mental health, or pretending that you are okay when you're not, can be both harmful and exhausting as opposed to asking for help. Um, my use of a golden tear, if you can uh, see that in the drawing, 
could um, have other meanings again. Uh, but to me, it represents the glamorising or romanticising of emotional turmoil we see in films, art and music. Not um, all, of course, but there's definitely a common theme we see that focuses on the dramatic side where the more um, mundane elements um, where we are just slogging along isn't always emphasised. Um, Therefore, this theatrical interpretation of mental illness we sometimes see in music and films and other medias, again, doesn't really reflect the reality of it. Like, hence the absurdity of a golden tear. Um, mental illness isn't this glorified image. But on the outside, people may assume or misunderstand what someone is going through, making it harder for the sufferer due to these misrepresentations. Um, I think in the media as well. Uh, the Oscar Wilde quote is also taken from The Decay of Lying, which really uh, explores the relationship between art and reality. Uh, thanks for listening to this, and if you can, please donate to Norwich Nightline. For that, but yeah. Thanks for coming. So, I hope you enjoyed that one by Isabella Stevens. Uh, we've got something a little bit similar, again, Healing Power of Art, um, but this one's by Jen Light who is actually our Educate first year rep this year as well. Um, so I hope you enjoy that one. Hello, my name's Jen and I'm a new member of the Educate Society. Um, I'm in my first year and I'm doing mental health nursing at UEA. I've sent in a piece of my artwork and I've named it Reach Out. Uh, the acrylic painting is inspired by Keith Haring, who is a favourite of mine. Um, I think it can be interpreted in many ways. For me, it represents how someone who may who may struggle with any mental health problem, like how they may feel, and how stigma can cause feelings of being a burden or being a weakness. It's a reminder by reaching out, we can take a step out of the dark that we might feel like we're constantly in and feel stronger with the connection of someone else. The floor represents how we're all grounded on the same earth and it's normal to have black holes. However, no one should feel permanently in the dark or alone. I hope you're enjoying the 24 hours and don't forget to donate to Norwich Nightline. But yeah, before we go, we'll introduce. Um, yeah. So we hope you enjoyed that by Jen Light as well. Um, we are going to take a little break of just sort of um showing you some stuff that other people have done and you're just gonna have me Anna and Becky for a little while <laughs> so we're just gonna have a bit of a chit chat um if we sh I think we should introduce ourselves again for anyone that's just joined newly so I'm Mariam I am Hedgecate's workshop lead this year and I work really close with Anna um to sort of take care of the workshops um Anna if you want to fill in a bit as well. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Anna and as Mariam said, we work together to coordinate and write up the workshops and just be in touch with the schools and the volunteers to make sure that everything runs smoothly. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> and then hand over to Becky as well. Um, so my name's Becky. I am a Hedgecate social sec. Um, so I mean, the clues in the name, isn't it? But um, I mainly am trying to get some more um, socials involved for our Educate members, um, just to try and get some more events like that um, going on. Um, yeah, um, I just kind of do a little um, bit of everything, really. I help Mariam and Anna run some of the workshops as well and things like that. Um, I just kind of do whatever's needed. <laughs> bit of social think, media as well. Yeah, I'm, I like just, that about... <laughs> I feel like that's a really nice thing about our committee we all kind of help each other out when we need it true yeah, yeah. it's so true like we as soon as we all started the committee this year um, it's the first time on a committee for me um yeah. and yeah everyone was um just so nice and Tori sort of uh when she introduced us all and everything um she was just saying that you know we can all get involved and do whatever so um, I remember because I initially went for publicity and where my aim was to do like social media and that side of things and like all the emails and stuff um, and then ended up doing social sec which I mean is great now I don't regret it at all I, I'm loving it but um, yeah but it's so good because she was like you can still get involved and do some bits and bobs with that as well 
um, we just all do a bit of everything, really, don't we? We really do. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's fun. It keeps us on our toes. <laughs> it does, yeah. True. I feel like all of us had at least one Canva experience. <laughs> Um, I feel like all of us were introduced to it through uh, being in this committee. Mm -hmm, Definitely. (laughs) Yeah, I feel like we should, honestly, it's part of, it's part of the society Mm -hmm. process completely. And yeah, it it was really nice to, um, to just be able to work throughout lockdown with you guys and with everyone else and just still keep doing Educate, although we couldn't do it as we normally would, and I feel like it kept all three of us going. Yeah, through sure. how crazy um, lockdown was. Yeah, definitely. It yeah. was definitely something that kept me sane throughout lockdown. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So um, for those of you that don't know, over lockdown we sort of started. Um, I wasn't formally on the committee yet. Um, um, well, Anna, was you on the committee last year? No, I wasn't, no. No, oh, we were both you, just volunteers last year. We used to do quite a lot of the workshops together. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah um, I, I hadn't even joined Educate until, like, literally lockdown. Um, and I messaged Tori about it, but, yeah, I'm asking to join. <laughs> um, and, um, yeah, so these girls were... Um, volunteers in the society and yeah we all sort of were trying to collaborate to get all the workshops that we normally do to um, secondary schools but um, trying to do them online so that was kind of our lockdown task (laughs) in lockdown one Um, but yes it was a good time (laughs) it was yeah it was it was it had its up and downs Uh, we kind of had the advantage of getting used to the whole online teaching online communication thing before we came to uni which for me personally it made things a lot easier especially with blackboard because every time my lecturers messed up or anything like that I could either tell them what to do (laughs) or I would understand them because it's so difficult to get everything done at the same time and still communicate and keep it um engaging without just pausing and panicking like oh my god what is going what is going on yeah um so yeah we did have that advantage of just being ready when yeah we came back for sure it was so good as well like for as soon as september started we could straight away just you know keep um keep going with the workshops and straight away start and get on with it which was amazing rather than having to figure it all out in September and start that beginning process but we'd already started that in lockdown one um yeah so it was definitely good I think for the society and also just to keep us sane because we had nothing to do (laughs) true Um, we we we, we volunteered but yeah (laughs) exactly and we ended up finding so such weird things being so entertaining and so funny like at some point we just ended up having blackboard and zoom jokes that <laughs> a regular like early 20s person would just not have <laughs> yeah <laughs> and all so these it, technical issues going wrong and everything but it's all funny in the is, end <laughs> it's just funny fun. now <laughs> funny now <laughs> we're gonna be so good at technology and stuff by the end of all these lockdowns and everything yeah, you uh, would hope so, wouldn't you? <laughs> I mean, even the streaming today, um, when I came on, I was like, I'm not sure what I was doing at all, like, ten, like with the tech-wise. But, yeah, it's hopefully gone okay. <laughs> I, I think we're doing good. I yeah. think we're doing quite good now. But, yeah, it's it's fun. And I feel like it helped all of us to just be more comfortable with speaking online as well. Because... Um, a lot of us are just a bit more introverted or just get nervous or just have like, you know, just brain freeze like I did like literally 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, so it just it, it just gave that practice, you know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I'm definitely less shy and stuff on camera and things now. I really was not, um, you know, that confident with it before, but I was def- I've grown in confidence, I think, as it's gone on. Or at least hopefully I have a little bit anyway. 
but yeah it's all good um but yeah we are yeah we are still running workshops um online at the minute until we can go in person again so um for those of you that um one of our main things that we get involved with is running mental health awareness workshops um we started doing secondary schools um initially but now we are doing um the primary school ones as well and we've done this in collaboration with the teddy bear hospital society at the uba which um has been super fun and um really good to get involved with and um if you want to get involved um at all if you're already a member um you should get emails about opportunities and if you're not a member just join it's really easy to go and on the su um website um it's only three pounds to join and um there's an exclusive like facebook page that we have and a discord and everything like that so um yeah it's good fun but um we have also um got some socials coming up as well so for christmas we're gonna do a movie night um and we're also doing secret santa um which the deadline is actually today midnight today if you wanted to sign up um you can do so as well on the SU website. Uh, but if you check out our Facebook and everything, it's all on the um, all on like the link tree or on our Facebook. You can check out all our events and links to bits and bobs there. Um, and if you need any help getting anywhere um, or um, with any information or with buying a membership or want to know more, then you can contact any of us um, either on our social pages. Um, or yeah or message directly if you have any of us as friends or anything on facebook that's absolutely fine i don't mind getting messages about it um we're all fine with that we're all chill yeah we're all friendly we're on bike and we yeah. we are all very easily excited about our plans especially the christmas ones uh so if you have any questions we're gonna get you're gonna get all the answers that you you need and probably even more because we're gonna start rambling on about them <laughs> um, but yeah you can same goes with uh, the workshops as well you can always contact me or mariam uh we've been doing this for a while now uh we were volunteers in our first year and we carried quite a few um workshops workshops in person um uh, we carry our, our first workshop actually was without um, a coordinator that did it before so we had to do it without any sort of guidance from someone who's experienced um, which was a journey and it was a learning experience uh, um, but yeah we've we've had all of the difficulties that you can ever imagine and then we um, transition to online um, we um, adapted our content to university students we also adapted it to primary school kids you kind of know the ins and outs and we know how scary it can be to volunteer and to speak in front of so many people um, but we know how to give you as much information that you need to actually carry these workshops as easily as possible. And um, we know how to give you that needed confidence boost that you need right before you walk into it. Um, and also like since you're online, uh, you don't necessarily see the people that you speak to. Um, most of the times we didn't even have our cameras on, um, which made it a lot easier. Uh, it certainly, made a lot of the worries that we had decrease um and i think that's the case with with becky as well i feel like we all felt way more comfortable because we had that um that gating between us and the people that we talked to um but yeah literally it's um so true like Basically, Anna and Mariam and some of the other members that have been around for longer uh, learned from their experiences and everything <laughs> and made my life a lot easier. I did my first primary school workshop the other day because um, I didn't get too involved in that um, in terms of like the planning it and things um, just because I was doing other things and I didn't have time to do that as well. But um, yeah, it was literally... Um, 
yeah, it wasn't so smooth and easy. Like they send you all instructions and everything, um, and um, a script and um, yeah. And I was um, put in as the coordinator because because I'd done some of the um, workshops before, like in lockdown and everything. So I knew how to do some of the technical things, and I was a bit worried because um, it was like videos and um, things um, that were a bit more technical to do. Um, with this primary workshop, but it was literally absolutely fine. Um, that, um, and they were on call, to, uh, sort of on call to be there. Um, if I needed any advice or anything, because they knew it was my first time. So Anna was like, "Just message me." <laughs> um, but literally, um, it was not a problem. And yeah, Anna and Mary are very patient with me when I um, message them about all my tech issues, and I'm like, "How do I do this? How do I do that?" <laughs> but you get the hang of it. <laughs> And yeah, because you, you do, yeah. And because it, it's, it, it's a learning process, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but um, with it being a member, you don't have to um, worry about all the tech stuff. That's just for us to worry about. So you just get to come in and do um, the fun bits, talking to to the um, students. So yeah, that's that's <laughs> not. Uh, uh, you can be a volunteer and you can go into the workshops and you can speak to the students but you can also get involved to the more um the other activities that we we carry so we can uh, for example last year we had a gala that Tori talked about uh, a bit earlier on um, and I was involved in that and I helped I helped like setting up and stuff like that you can um get involved in our quizzes um fundraisers we had um the blog as well we have a blog uh, which is really exciting we also collaborated with uh, students from global health in uh, our fundraiser for um um oh my god <laughs> what was it for <laughs> ah, for calm that's the one waited <laughs> for that one um and um some of us did uh walks for it um we raised um uh, we raised a lot of money almost 1500 pounds and our target was 500 pounds so that was amazing to see um and yeah there's lots of opportunities to do other stuff with the society except other than just volunteering it for schools um so yeah i think i'm gonna Pass on to Becky so she can talk about why we're here today. So, remind us all. <laughs> this week is uh, Nightline Awareness Week, and um, one of the literally the reason why we're here today doing this live stream is to raise money for Norwich Nightline. So, um, if you guys can, if you feel able to, even if it's just a pound or um, a small amount, um, go around please, please donate to Nightline. Um, we just want to be able to help support them, continue their amazing work at UEA. Um, the lockdown and COVID and everything, um, Nightline did take quite a financial hit during that time. So um, it's really important um, about that, um, that we try and raise the money. So I think there should be a link above my head um, to the, um, it's essentially the SU website um, and Nightline's page on there and you should be able to donate um yeah and um anything you can we really appreciate it if you can't donate and you don't feel able to but you still want to help any shares on any social live stream posting on instagram stories anything like that we really appreciate it and we are actually um doing a giveaway competition um sending out packages of snacks of kettle chips and um popcorn um so if you wanted to try and get involved with the giveaway um just share the live stream on facebook using the hashtag um mh24 live and tag us as well and if you have a look on the um facebook event page um and also on our instagram story you can see the the full details on there written down just in case you weren't sure what to do but um yeah um i'm trying to think if there's anything else to tell you guys about um later on in the morning um around 5 a.m um me anna and mariam are going to be live um doing the early morning session 
um, for the live stream. We are going to be baking. We decided <laughs> this fairly last minute. We are in no way um, qualified <laughs> to be telling people how to bake. Um, personally, the last time I baked or did anything at all, I think it was a Betty Crocker cake from a mix. But we're going to make cookies. We're going to attempt it. Oh, yeah, we're um, going to attempt to make cookies. <laughs> I feel like that's more of an apt uh, description of what is going to go on. Yeah, uh, attempt <laughs> might be a better word. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're going to attempt the cookies. So come and join us if you feel up to it, if you're an early bird. Um, I can't say I am, but I'm going to have to be tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, um, we're, all, we're all going to attempt it. So, um, just as a reminder of what is going to happen um, in, the in the following next few hours, uh, we're going to have a talk about mental health globally from Oxfam and Students for Global Health, uh, followed by um, a talk about craps, creative therapy and mental health. We're also going to have a live talk about autism and one about the history of mental health. Um, and then a live discussion with um, Labour Society um, and a love, live discussion about men's mental health. Uh, but for now, we're going to introduce Oxfam and Students for Mental Health. Um, and we're going to have a nice chat about uh, global mental health. Ah. Sorry. So that's actually going to happen in a few minutes time. Um, in three minutes at half past. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that I, one. That's okay. Anna's just introducing him a bit early. <laughs> but um, yeah, spoilers. <laughs> uh, there's going to be a mental health discussion in a few minutes time. Um, but yes, we have a tight um, schedule and things are happening um, exactly um, you know, on time and everything. So we're really sorry about that. <laughs> um, yes. Um, any other um, Hedge Kate news, Anna, that we I forgot to mention? Can you think of anything? Um, let me think. Um, we had panel discussions as well. We didn't talk about that sort of thing that we did. We had um, a melanin and mental health talk uh, for the third year running. Um, uh, which was really informative. I really enjoyed it. And we're going to have some of the speakers um, coming back for our Mental Health 24 live stream, which is very exciting. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that one just because they're very engaging. Um, and again, it was very, very informative. Um, and yeah, that's all I can think about now. <laughs> How about you, Becky? Um. I'm trying to think if there's any other updates, but at the minute I can't think of anything. But um, yeah, just thank you everyone that has donated so far. Um, it's literally um, so amazing. Every penny, every pound helps so much. And um, yeah, we're really hoping to hit a target today. Um, I believe it's a thousand pounds that Nightline are trying to um, raise. So it's a big target, but we're hoping we can get there. We've got 24 hours. <laughs> and yeah it's for a really good cause so if you can donate at all please 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 do um and if you know anyone that can um send them the links or tell them how to donate um anyone can donate you don't have to be a uba student if you are an external person or like a member of staff or anything you can um donate as a guest on the student union website um and yes the link should be above my head somewhere um, they've been trying so hard to get their services up and running um, again since having to close um, over the lockdown period. Um, yeah, so literally all of it, all these donations help and just the awareness as well. We want to make sure that students know that they can um, contact someone if they are feeling like they need to, if they're feeling low, down, worried or stressed. Nightline are there, you can call them. And yeah, we just want to help them. <laughs> right, so I think it's time to finally uh, introduce students.
Um, so there's just some technical issues. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. It's just going to be a little bit of a delay um, with the next um, pre-recording. Um, but it will be on soon. So coming up later on, um, we have lots of things going on. We have um, a talk about the Buddy SU scheme within the uni happening at four o'clock. And that is live with Tori. She's going to be uh, chatting to them. And we have a mental health keep fit session at quarter past four. We also have um, another segment on arts and crafts and mental health um, on, with Amy Zill and um, that's going to be at half four, uh, quarter to five we have um, some photography um, we're going to be showing and at five o'clock is when there's going to be an autism talk live and yeah um, after that, there's going to be a segment about the history of mental health. And at half five is when Labour Life is happening and we're going to be chatting with the Labour Society. OK, and what else have we got on? At uh, quarter to six, men's mental health, um, we're going to be talking about um, for November. And again, that's going to be a live segment as well. And we've also got some original songs from um, Nav. She's an amazing singer songwriter who's going to be playing some of our songs at um, quarter past six. And there's also going to be a musical performance after that um, with some original songs as well from the show choir just after at 25 past six. At half six, there's going to be um, the Drama Society um, and Nav Spoken Word Poetry. And there's also going to be a talk at 20 to seven from um the bloody good period society about that time of the month sorry there's um there's gonna be lots more on and um stay tuned for all of that um yes there's gonna be a hedge cake takeover at 11 p.m so there's going to be some educators coming on and having a chat as well and the committee um our uea committee are going to come on and have a, a chat and um chill out and have some hot chocolates from around half 12. and yeah there is lots on um, there's also going to be a national chill and chat later on. OK, I think the technical issues have resolved. Uh, we are now going to go on to the segment as planned. So um, this is going to be um, mental health chat, as we said, um, with Students for Global Health and the Oxfam Society. So I will let that um, I will let them take over. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my god, god sorry. sorry. Oh my god, sorry. Hi. Wait, hi. Wait, hi. 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 I'm just 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 I'm Um, so hi, my name's Helen. My Wi-Fi is really bad, so I'm not sure if you can keep going anyways. Um, Students for Global Health is a society, it's part of a national society, 
global health, as the name suggests. So basically, we really want a world where there's equity to all healthcare around the world, regardless of who you are um, and what you need. So at UEA, we have lots of fun stuff going on. So, so far this year, we started off collab which went really well it was a suicide prevention evening and then we followed that up with a calm it's already been mentioned but a calm lost hours walk and we raised um triple our just an amazing event we're really proud of it um since then we've also done a racism in the nhs evening on homelessness which was on thursday if you're interested in any of them they're up on our facebook um, in the future we've got climate change and refugee health um coming up so any of those facebook page you can find out more um but i think that's everything from students um i might think of some more later and pop it in <laughs> thank you and um your vice president do you want to just introduce yourself oh can't hear you phil is that We can't hear Rashida, but she's unmuted herself. We'll go to Amy for a minute and we will come back to you, Rashida. Sorry, that's our fault. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy. Um, I'm the president of Oxfam. Um, and so a bit about us, um, pretty self-explanatory. We're part of the Oxfam Society. Um, there's a lot of different, um, sorry, that's from my child. There's a lot of different advising and all that various different universities um, and so kind of yeah what we've done so far this year um, we've had um, a topic on fast fashion for our um, September and October time um, in which we had a documentary screening and discussion that went really well um, and then we've just recently made some blankets for homeless people so we made patches out of um, old clothing to kind of like promote sustainable fashion as well reusing clothing so we made patches out of that um and then sewed them all together um and made blankets to hang out to homeless people in Norwich this winter so that was really great as well um we can't wait for them to like get warmer <laughs> this winter with those um and so yeah that's basically it for this year but we've got some things coming up next year um it's kind of covid related as well as some climate change workshops in high schools um, and yeah, so yeah, that's a bit about me and our society. Lovely. And the other person joining you from your committee? Hi, my name is hey. Rebecca. Um, I am the former, well, I say former, I love Oxfam too much to leave, um, uh, media and communications officer, if you will. Um, uh, I used to, first of all, Oxfam is bloody amazing you should all just join because amy is doing some incredible things like you've heard about um the homelessness the homelessness homelessness initiative if you will uh but a bit about me uh international relations and politics student second break in studies because mental health is fantastic um and i am um, currently just a student of life love and languages i'm just going to do what i can to help whoever i can um currently working in tesco's they have some issues that i'm trying to you know fix from the inside um but yeah it's, essentially i'm just trying to i'm sorry i'm just i'm just a mess <laughs> um, oh, thank you. um yeah, I'm just trying to learn as much as I can so that I can essentially cleanse my mind and soul because I think I think we don't talk enough as as people. Yeah. Um, but I think what you guys are doing at Educate are absolutely incredible, and I think, um, yeah, it's 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 as a UEA initiative, it's it's, it's fantastic. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate you guys doing this. Yeah, and thank you for joining us uh, to all of you. And should we go to Rashida and see if we've got her now? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Still not getting Rashida, Phil. Mm. Hmm. <laughs> we'll, we'll think about that. We'll 
keep you unmuted, Rashida, just in case. In case and, and just, just um, we'll see. We'll see what's going on. Um, in the meanwhile, just so we have some stuff um, going off. I mean, you guys have already kind of given us a, a bit of an idea of what you guys have um, been doing and, and, and things that you've got planned um, for the future as well. And there seems to be like quite a bit of overlap there um, and quite a lot of it links to mental health in some ways. Um, so I guess to both of you want to give us a little bit of a, a summary or some of your thoughts about how um, homelessness and like mental health kind of, I mean, obviously we know that there is like a link there, but do you want to talk a little bit about that? If that's something you, you know anything about? Uh, should I go? <laughs> Sorry, my friends are popping up because they're watching the stream. Um, oh, shit. One sec. Pardon my French or my English. Um, yeah, yeah. Please try not to swear. I apologize. I do apologize. Uh, I'm working on my potty mouth. Um, homelessness is really important to me. Um, I was formerly homeless, if you will. Um, um, I, I hope personal anecdotes are okay. Like, yeah, I hope. Of yeah. Um, yeah. So essentially, my uh, my mum, brother, and I used to live in a box room above a club because the council couldn't really uh we were evicted so the council couldn't um provide us with anything else which is not their fault like they're very overwhelmed um and so this was during my a-levels and let's just say i didn't do well i did my a-levels in like three years which is fine because education is you can you can be ed you can go into education at any point in your life and still be fine you know qualifications as much as university is fantastic sorry if i talk a lot i do talk a lot <laughs> um right um yeah um why homelessness is important in terms of mental health i think it, it on you because um home is where the heart is and all that good stuff but when you don't have a home uh, what do you do like who do you go to and um i think i think people are lovely and i think people can be a, very supportive and but the system the way it is at the moment uh it doesn't really allow for that to work like you take covid for example and um everything was fine all, all of a sudden shelters are open and like you, people can pop in and it's all good right but as soon as as soon as it's fixed, um, now shelters once again are like fifteen pounds to get in. Like, do you know what I mean? And I used to work at Biddy's Tea Room. Plug to Biddy's Tea Room. Go check out independent shops. Um, um, and having to see people live in cardboard boxes, it's it's crazy. Like. I feel so privileged to have a have a home or even if it was a box room, do you know what I mean? And people don't have that. And it's raining, it's pouring and the old man is not snoring, you know, like, um, it, oh, sorry, my, my, um. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, do you want to take over? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, and to add to that, like, people <laughs> that um, are walking down the street and seeing homeless people on the street as well, I think it's, so important for us not to like treat them as I don't know like inhumane or something like and just not just ignore them like I've had conversations with him people before and I think it's just so like diminishing just to like be ignored all day to like try and if you're like asking for help or, or for some food or literally just if you want someone to talk to you and for people just to like ignore you on the street and kind of thing because mm. I feel like that is kind of how people handle seeing homeless people on the street they just like kind of just want to um just think that they aren't there and, and ignore them and that they don't exist but I think it's just really important to still treat them as an equal they're still people and just to like have a normal conversation with them like you would any other person as well I think it would just make such a difference to their day no 100 percent. i couldn't agree more on you like i i think they have such interesting stories like every time like 
be it on a night out or you're just strolling down the street and you just stop and just like even if you share a word with them they have all such interesting stories and I think this is why again like talking is so important um, and I think when you talk to these people and you hear about their stories like they've all been this that and the other but essentially life happens um and they're at the point where they are now but that doesn't mean that's the be all end of of their life they could become do you know what i mean like uh homelessness doesn't equate to the destination does that make mm-hmm. sense like yeah yeah, yeah. Um, uh- Helen and Rashida, did you have anything to add? Rashida, should we try, try you again <laughs> once more? Yeah, I'm not she's having some um, difficulties, but I'll just, <laughs> I'm also having some Wi-Fi problems. So, um, the, but um, from what I heard um, from Oxfam, completely agree with what brought up. Um, in terms of what we think at Students for Global Health, in terms of mental health, um, it's something that you can't ever avoid with any any health issue. You've always got to think about us and not just the disease that you're treating. And um, beyond, I think every topic that we're covering this year, so racism in the NHS, homelessness, mm-hmm. refugee health, climate change, they all, you can't ignore the mental health issues and the impact that that will have, whether that's the primary thing on or whether that's um just a secondary thing to think of on the side um it's always going to have and it always has and we just can't ignore it anymore and you know keep it to ourselves and I think that's the most important thing is just to like events like this is just so important to get it out there that um, yeah, be doing things because yeah you, you can't um you can't ignore it yeah and thank you and again like thank you all of you for joining us for the 24 hours and like taking some time out of your Saturday to join us um so something that both of you probably have some opinion or some like insight into is kind of mental health uh, globally and differences in um maybe in healthcare or access <laughs> to healthcare in like various parts of the world um oh sorry Karen. Oh, shit. Did you want to go ahead with that? Oh no, no! I was just waiting for Tori to finish. I, I, I have. I, I was just sorry. My listening skills need hell. I am. I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm working on it. <laughs> My internet has been really unstable through the whole thing. But um, I was just asking if you guys have any insight into like mental health uh, globally um, and like different access and um, areas of the world with different healthcare and mental health care to us. No. Um, hundred percent like I am a Bangladeshi woman first and foremost and let's just say um, (laughs) mental health is uh, non-existent if you will um, back home Um, I say that but I think things are improving since since I think I think as as bad as COVID has been like COVID has been devastating but in 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 other ways it really has been a blessing in disguise in terms of getting people to finally, uh, what's the word, finally kind of understand that emotions are important and your emotions are valid. And just because, not just because, but essentially Bangladesh, Asian culture, Bangladeshi culture, Southeast Asian culture, uh, because they all have to be so stoic and like very kind of head on, do your work, what is depression like if you hear our stories you won't know what depression is do you know what I mean like like I speak to my parents sometimes like we my mum and I had a long chat about we just sat on the sofa watching the sunrise and had a chat about mental health and I'd just come out of hospital due to a psychotic breakdown and she was like it wasn't her invalidating my feelings it was essentially her saying you guys talk about mental health and yes it is important to talk about it but a lot of the times we don't have the scope to talk about it because we can't. We have 
we don't have food. We don't have this. We don't have a proper democracy. We can't speak about things um, freely. So how can you even think about asking us to talk about mental health? Like when we speak about mental health, it's like, where is the access? Our healthcare is non-existent to be fair. Like my aunt just died of colon cancer. Do you know what I mean? So in terms of physical health, it's like problematic. Like Southeast Asian, uh, Southeast Asia education is fantastic. We have great doctors, but essentially we all come to foreign countries. I say foreign countries. I mean, like I am British as well, but like, you know what I mean? I don't know if you know what I mean. Let me not assume, but <sighs> Essentially, what I'm trying to say is, long story short, mental health access is uh, non-existent in Bangladesh. And until people ha start having these conversations in their homes and start speaking to the, the generational gap is really, really what it is. Like, because back then, I sound like I'm a 30 year old or something, but like back then, like they don't talk about it. Oh, you're depressed. Go eat some rice. Like I... My, so I found out my aunt passed away um, like last night and the first thing I did was eat like a whole bucket of wings. Like, do you know what I mean? So like my aunt had a whole plate of rice. Like we're like, we have to do, like, it's crazy. Like, um, it's, I don't want to say crazy. Oh my God, I feel so unfiltered, but I have <laughs> so sensitive great. issues. I don't believe in censorship. Anyway, um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, I, what you're saying like, is really important and some, some of the things that we try and talk about at HedgeK is um, Black and Asian ethnic minority groups, mental health and, and a lot of the things that do come up when we talk about it in panel discussions is exactly what you're talking about there, about um, kind of elders not like saying, you know, the hardships we've been through to be where we are and, and be living in Britain and all this and you don't, you can't imagine and things like that, so... Yeah, I think we're going to be um, showing a pre-recorded interview from um, some of the people from Ghanaian and Indian society. I think it's at, at 8.50 tonight. I think that's when it is, um, where they've been talking a little bit more about um, black and, and Asian ethnic minorities, mental health as well. So, as again, like, thank you for your, your insight there. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? Like British, and I can't really compare it. <laughs> you can, babe. You really can. <laughs> okay. But I, it, that's just made me appreciate. I know that, like, we complain about the English mental health system and stuff, and there's a lot to be done. But like, I feel like we're we're getting somewhere compared to other places, and we should be a bit more appreciative of that as well. But that's not to say that like there's definitely more to be done. Yeah. I just. I just wanted to add quickly, um, not quickly, I, I do go on tangents, I apologise. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to apologise, I'm so sick of apologising. Um, male mental health in, 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 in Asian cultures, I think, I think male mental health is so, 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 so important. Um, actually, mental health in general, let me not do the whole gender disparity thing. Um, what? what are these words I'm using? I don't even know what they mean. <laughs> I do, I do, but uh, I'm not using it in the right context. Um, like, men back home need to realise, and I say back home, I'm referring to, again, my Southeast Asian background. Because they're so used to being the breadwinners and yes, it's all on patriarchy and I, that's not lost on me, but I forget we forget as a society again Southeast Asian society like how depressed our men are like Bangladesh uh trigger warnings all of the good stuff like the male suicide rate is is ridiculous like be it due to education or the pressures of family or um or just just needing to just be there because uh women are deemed as this fragile emotional beings that can't handle stuff but we can our women are so so strong like and I hate the word strong because like I hate when women are described as strong I'm just like yeah we are strong and what like we have to be strong you know um but again going back sorry men male mental health but I just think I just want my men when I say my men I mean the brown men black brown men 
to realize that it's okay to cry. Like I was telling my uncle today on the phone, like people around his his wife had just died, right? And he was having trouble crying, which is fine. People process emotions differently, right? But essentially people around him was like, why are you crying? You shouldn't cry, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, let the man cry. Like his wife has just died, you know, like, um, and, and people already being on him to be like, what are you going to do next? Like how, what's going to happen with your kids? I'm like, dude, he's literally buried his wife. Give him a second to like breathe. Um, and I think we forget like, yes, there are issues like men, mankind. I'm sorry. Like, I love you all men, but like the patriarch is real. You all know that. Uh, but mankind also need to be supported, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. And we have also got someone from uh, the president of UEA Tennis Society coming on a little bit later to speak about men's mental health specifically, as it is also November month, which is when we talk about men's mental health. But um, I know that Helen wanted to um, have a little thing there as well. Yeah, so um, less from a personal perspective, but just from sort of statistics, it is obviously the UK mental health scene isn't great we've all seen the services or the services that we have but um a 2017 study by um who organization found that there was so an average in a health um high income country of seven um mental health workers per 100,000 population but in low income countries that's down the global average is nine these aren't you know good statistics to hear and even in, so Washington, D.C. in America, there's more Starbucks <laughs> than there are mental health workers. So there's a lot to be done and that we need more people out there um, being educated in, you know, a, a big setting so that we can get people, this, because there is a huge disparity, whether you're in a high income or a low income. Yeah, thank you. I mean, we, we got... I think um, your, yeah, as you said, your Wi-Fi dipped in and out there, but we got some of your statistics. But um, I'd be interested to like know the statistic about the Starbucks workers and healthcare workers. Um, I think you said there was more Starbucks workers than there were um, care workers. Yeah, that's quite um, out of proportion there. Um, Is that in America, sorry. I think, um Washington DC in America oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah that's quite quite drastic but yeah thank you for that little insight and statistics um so just from a kind of uh personal perspective I mean we're all students here I know that we've got um two fourth year med students with us um from students for global health what would you guys say is your we'll have like one from each of you um, Rashida, if you want to tell us what it is via the chat, and then maybe Helen can share your your um, one self care tip. Um, so, should we start with Amy or just Oxfam? Go on, Amy. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I've zoned out a little bit. It's one <laughs> kind of self. Sorry. Can you repeat yeah. the question again? Yeah. Just like one self care tip, or you know, one piece of advice about mental health. Okay, um, I think that it's, I think it's better for people, wait, let me try and word this right. I like got a thought, but I'm trying to word it. Um, to like, you, I think it's not good to just assume that everybody is 100% okay and getting on with life. Because I, th I think people need to realise that everybody has issues, everybody kind of is struggling with something and we should talk about it more and share that more between people and not just assume that you're the only person dealing with this kind of thing um so just generally more openness especially like as students i feel like a lot of our issues are translatable and everybody's kind of dealing with the same thing um especially in kind of like in a in first year and like um when you're moving into a new flat kind of thing, especially when like you're just surrounded by new people, it's just knowing that like you're all kind of dealing with the same thing and it's just really, I think people should share that more. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so 
maximum 20 seconds from the rest of you just because we're running a little bit short on time Wait, yeah me and Rashida oh sorry. Um, me and Rashida thing just guys it's not something I always um remember to follow but you always feel better after it even if you feel rubbish so I'd always say get out outside I think that was I think we lost you there Helen but was that like get outside or <laughs> getting yeah my wife was really bad but yeah we both thought exercise yeah and Rashida's was um like yoga to help her relax uh, even after a long week even if she feels like she doesn't have time so thank you Rashida and finally <laughs> last but not least who's that you yourself oh, God. Me. <laughs> sorry oh sorry sorry um um me I'm I'm sat in a car park waiting to go out and have a have a run if you will <laughs> yeah blow some smoke um i'm joking i'm joking i'm joking don't i'm joking um but essentially i think my self-care tip is uh do what it what makes you feel fulfilled like i think happiness is a actuality that we Aristotle said that i think about actuality and potentiality and all that good stuff um essentially we we are all trying to find this perfection that does not exist right um do what makes you feel fulfilled and do what you're passionate about. If it's sitting there and watching TV, watch it. If it's going out and sometimes I just dance in the rain and up in forest, like I just, I got stuck barefoot, you know, like, so do what you want to do because the life is so bloody, sh sorry, <laughs> life is so short. Like, um, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, do what makes you happy. I hate the word happy because what is happiness, but yeah, yeah. What, what you feel fulfilled about yeah yeah I mean yeah um, we I think we'll leave that there that was a nice little way to wrap it up like just like summarizes everything we've kind of talked about together but thank you so much to everyone from Oxfam Wait, and sorry, students oh, for global health oh sorry one sec uh, Oxfam, love Amy a lot because um, Amy is doing some fantastic things <laughs> and go and support Amy please and Oxfam okay Cool. Yeah, um, I'll just give like my own plug for Oxfam and Students for Global Health. They both do incredible work, um, both to do with mental health and just to do with like generally helping people and raising awareness of important issues. And we've we've worked alongside both of them for for a fair few things over the past um, couple of years. So yeah, keep um, keep supporting them. And yeah, thank you both of uh, Students for Global Health and Oxfam for joining us. Um, and yeah, give us a little wave. Sorry, Rashida, that uh, we couldn't hear from you. Rashida, um, you're beautiful. Your smile is like making me want to jump up and down. <laughs> Bless. So yeah, that was that was that. Thank you so much, guys. And we still have quite a lot to do. And you know, in that time while we were chatting, it's gone completely dark in my room. Um, <laughs> and I, I do have a light that I can switch on, but I'm not sure exactly at which point I'm going to do that. Um, so I'm going to... So thank you, Megan, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? It's going really well so far. I've been really enjoying it. Oh, thank you. It's been, uh, it's been <laughs> great. It's been uh, mad. Uh, <laughs> don't, I don't like using that, that word. Um, but yeah, how, how's, um, how's everything with Buddy SU? Also the same. <laughs> yeah. So very busy, which is really, really great. Should I kind of talk a bit about what Buddy is for people that don't know? Yeah, definitely go for it. So Buddy SU is our student support scheme here on campus at UEA. And it's a student support scheme run by students for students with our amazing coordinator, Amy. And so far this year, we've trained over 300 students to become Buddy volunteers 
And we've taken on about over 500 new students that our volunteers have been able to support. So it's an amazing scheme where students can help other students because they've had the same experiences as them and they kind of know what they're going through. That's brilliant. I mean, I have just got involved with the Buddy SU scheme for the first time this uh, this year and I've got one buddy and we get on really nicely. It's um, such a shame with COVID that we haven't managed to actually be able to meet like face to face. Um, yeah. So, but we've been having Skype calls quite regularly and and texting. So it's it's nice to to be able to help um, someone who's also kind of my age because I'm a graduate. So um, it's nice to have been paired with another graduate so that we have like some similarities in common. We both feel maybe a little bit more mature than some some other people. So it's nice that they paired us. Um, yeah. What made you get involved with Buddy SEO? Um, I joined as a volunteer like yourself September last year because I saw it as a volunteering opportunity so I thought I'd get involved so last year for the first semester I supported one student and I really enjoyed it then in January I applied to become a student leader and the student leaders helped to run the scheme with Amy and then I got the role because I had all these ideas for university and all these things I wanted to change if I could. And I had no idea how to make those ideas happen or who to talk to. So that really gave me the opportunity where if I had an idea, it went, it like got ran for Amy and then it would become real. So with the Instagram page that I run, that was an idea I thought of over the summer. I thought, how can we communicate better with students this year? It's going to be really difficult. How can we improve that? So I put the idea forward, it went through all the relevant people and they approved it. And that's now like my little baby. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. kind of all those creative ideas I had and concepts and things that before I just had no idea how to make them happen. I now can make them happen, which is really great. Yeah, it's lovely. And for anyone that is watching that wants to follow the Instagram page, what is the handle? At UEA Buddy SU. <laughs> lovely and simple. So yeah. <laughs> you'll be able to find it. Um, and what about you? What are you uh, studying at UEA and what year are you in and how are you enjoying uni? Um, I'm doing a third year education, so currently working through my dissertation which I think the fact that I am a student too gives me that quite unique experience. So when I am talking to students, especially through the Instagram account, it's kind of a first point of call for a lot of students. They know that on the other side of it, they are talking to a student who knows the exact same feeling of the stress of online learning when Blackboard's down or the library's down, you can't access what you need to online. All those stresses that I understand more so than someone who is maybe their lecturer who is not going through the exact same experience as them. It's an identical experience. So I feel like that's really benefited me this year is to be on that same level as them. Yeah, I agree. And obviously, um, I know um, Amy is part of the SU and kind of um, runs the scheme, but I, I agree with you. It's nice to know that there's kind of that student um, representation there. Also, like kind of as a representation for all the buddies as well, I guess. Um, yeah, definitely. And kind of looking after things um, from from that perspective. Um, tell us a bit about some of the the events that you've already run with uh, Buddy SU this scheme. I know that there's been a fair few cool things. Yeah, we've had a lot going on so far this time. I think one of the most exciting things is we got approved for the buddy beginners fund this term which meant that any of our new students who were signed up for the buddy scheme if they wanted to join a club or society we could help them with that fund because joining clubs and societies there is a cost with it we all know that I'm all aware of it and we do know that's a barrier for students especially joining a sport so it was really great to be able to support some new students to get them to join so they can expand that group outside their flat And then coming up, which I'll plug next Tuesday, we have an event with British Sign Language Society because one of my big focuses this year is really increasing our accessibility and our inclusivity. So we're running an event with them next Tuesday where we're going to learn Last Christmas in Sign Language. So a really fun way to get our buddies something to do on a Tuesday night if you're just sitting in your flat with not really a lot to do. Just events you can go to online that are a bit different that you wouldn't have maybe gone to before and also learn a new skill whilst you're there. Yeah, yeah, that's lovely. Um, and I really look forward to seeing how the, the Christmas songs um, pan out and everything. Yeah. Um, 
what what do you think um as a as a body to um some new students at UEA what do you think are kind of the biggest factors impacting on mental health would you say for freshers I think one of the big things is not knowing where to go for help. I feel like that is a big factor at the moment. There is such an overwhelming amount of different support options that when it comes to being a new student, it can be a bit difficult to know where to go and like who you need to talk to. So I feel like with the buddy page, they can message me directly saying, hey, I'm having this academic issue or this mental health issue who do I talk to? Then I take that on on their behalf so they don't need to spend their time worrying about who they need to email. I work out for them and let them know because that can be one of the biggest things is starting that conversation and wanting to get help. So definitely just trying to take some of that stress off of them at the moment when you have a 100 things to do. That's one less thing that you have to worry about. And I think it really is just one of the other big barriers is just trying to make friends this year. As a first year, you're told, oh, you're going to love Freshers Week. There's so much to do. You're going to meet so many people. And they've just not had that opportunity this year, unfortunately. So trying to set up events like in collaboration with Sign Language Society where you can come along, you can meet some new people. There's no pressure if you want to burrito yourself in your bed in your duvet and not turn your camera on. You can just come along and message some new people and definitely building those communications between our current students and our new students so you always know that you have at least one friend on campus. Yeah, I love it. And um, what you were saying about um, support and knowing um, where to go and stuff and the fact that you're kind of taking that on yourself, um, helping them out with um, where they need to go for support, I think that's really really nice of you to do and I know that I've had people come to me asking um for various resource information and there's there is loads of different support out there whether it's for um like a a physical disability mental health disability or um like finance issues or um social issues like there's kind of help for everything at some somewhere in the uni and it's just knowing where where to find it um definitely and it's great to know that you you can help people with that. So if anyone wants to like find, you know, Megan can do a little bit of um, searching yeah. for you and find something. Um, I was also going to say on the Hedgecate link tree, which you can find in our Instagram little link, we've got a few um, of the resources that, um, I mean, again, it, it's a little bit busy, but it's got um, some of the kind of supports that are available, which has been put together by student services. Um, but yeah there's also some nice little graphics that student services have made about all the different things that they can help with but yeah it sounds like you're doing a, a great job um with what you're doing um another thing that you were talking about is um freshers and how obviously making friends and everything has has been a bit different and difficult uh because of covid but um do you think and have, have you seen that buddy su has, has helped with that I mean, I think like definitely I do see through the messages because each week I do a weekly check in on our story where you don't even have to message us. You can react with an emoji or there's like a sliding scale and you just tell us how you've been feeling. And then I will message you straight away being like, hi, I'm just checking in because you reacted. And then sometimes you do get students who they have been really struggling. But then sometimes I get to talk to students who are like, oh, I baked cookies this week. I had a really great week. And then I'm able to, if they're like, oh, I'm feeling like a bit isolated, my flat, I've all gone home for lockdown, I'm here alone. I'm then able to direct them to different events that are going on that I think they'd enjoy. So then they can make friends through that way. So I think it definitely is a different friend making experience. But I do think there are all of the options out there. It's just knowing where to find them is really the big thing, I think. Yeah, um, I agree. And I mean, I know that you're also a, a member of Hedgecate this year and seen your like all of our socials. So thanks for your support. But yeah. also, yeah, no, I find that we've like really been trying to create a, a place where people can make friends, even if it's online and not necessarily in person. But we hope that when things do start to go back to normality a little bit, we say that we don't know what it means, but then hopefully people will, will have some friends that they, they met online. Yeah, hopefully. I think all the clubs and societies have been doing such like an incredible job of doing online events. I really do think like a lot of the feedback I get of when I ask people, like, oh, I've like you gone to any online events. They all speak like so highly of everything they've gone to, which is really nice to hear. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, do you have any final 
words or tips or anything you'd like to to add um I think it's just at the moment like we've been saying all day is just to take care of yourself even if all you achieve today is you drink a glass of water (laughs) I know for me when I'm feeling really I'm just not in the mood for anything I'm just not having a good day I will just go and do a load of washing and I feel productive and I'm like that's it for the day I've been productive nothing for the rest of the day so I think it is just one big thing is just try to do one productive thing a day even if it is you just get up and you brush your teeth you've been productive congrats yeah I love that (laughs) it's really great just one simple thing yeah Mm -hmm. um thank you so much for joining us today Megan it's been really nice to chat and I know that we've um had some interactions um through um Hedgecate and Buddy SU and um everything like that and it's been it's been really lovely to share that with everyone and everyone remember to join uh, to follow the Instagram page yeah um, and also if you're interested in getting involved in the Buddy SU I'm I'm sure you could get um in touch with Megan um yeah. through again through the page on Instagram and she'll be able to let you know kind of when there's opportunities about yeah definitely thank you so much thank you so much for joining us Megan thank you bye <laughs> bye thank you oh gosh it really got dark in my room how about you turn your light on? I think that would be. Ah, <laughs> uh, gosh, it's been. A... I I should go and turn your light on before it gets too dark. Oh. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, and I've managed to press the unmute button because I've been in the background during all of this. No one wants to hear from me. But uh, uh, so, yes, yeah, that's why I've been muted, because I've been doing all the button pushing and all the technical gubbins uh, trying to solve technical issues. But yes, uh, so that's why I was muted just now. Uh, so, yes, I'm back uh, with an update. Uh, we've now found out from uh, Jake that uh, drum roll. I don't know how that's going to sound. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, we should be, we're now at £154 raised so far, so that's not bad. Oh, we want more? I mean, we are, what is this? Uh, my brain cannot do the maths at this time of day, or indeed any time of day. We're not even, but we're at £154, which is great. So keep bringing it in, keep going on to the, um, keep it coming. Go to the link, which I've just realised I haven't added to this bit of chat, so I will add that. Um, but before that, we've got some uh, more uh, little video short films for you, and we've got an interview. We have an interview with, uh, it's all to do with nursing, is the next one. Do you want to introduce it while I press all the buttons? Okay, uh, I'll, well, I'll start off by introducing myself. Uh, my name's De Sweep. Uh, I'm a second year business management student. Um, and today we have Lou with us from Nursing Society, who is going to be uh, discussing the topic of mental health. Uh, so welcome, Lou. Thank you for doing this. Um, I'd uh, just quickly like to, you know, introduce yourself, uh, what course you're on, uh, what committee, uh, what role you have on the committee for Nursing Society. Uh, and a little bit about the society itself, if you don't mind. Okay, no worries. Um, yeah, my name's Lou. I'm a third year mental health nursing student. Right. Um, my role on the society this year is the Equality and Diversity Officer. And I suppose the Nursing Society, um, it kind of does what it says on the tin, really. It's a society for the nursing students within UEA. Um, and we try to, I suppose, support them as much as, as, much as possible. And obviously, like I think with a lot of the societies in the moment, it's it's more and more difficult thanks to the the current uh, the current situation with COVID. But I say we're we're kind of on hand, um, for any kind of questions, queries, and sometimes just to um, 
Sometimes it can just be a bit of a friendly ear for people who, you know, like say as a third year for second and first years and and kind of and then also learning new stuff from the first and second years. So, yeah, I suppose like most of the societies, we kind of do the same thing. So what sort of interested you in the in the role to go for equality and diversity officer in, in the committee? Um, the role itself, um, I think it's. It's really interesting, isn't it? Um, equality and diversity. Um, I come from a work, my previous kind of employment where they changed the words equality and diversity to diversity and inclusion, um, mm-hmm. and kind of you know, and I actually I prefer that that as a, a role name rather than equality and diversity. But it's about looking at you know the nurse society, the nurse and students that we've got all come from diverse backgrounds. Um, whether that be cultural, spiritual, um, gender, uh, wh- whatever. And so for me, I believe that obviously we should be, it's not, and again, that's why it's not treating people equal because we don't, we don't want to be treating people equally. We want to be treating people as diverse and do what we do to be inclusive. Yeah, so you, you sound quite like passionate about it, so that's that's always good. Like you do <laughs> what you're passionate about. So the first sort of uh, main question I have uh, revolving around the, our, our main topic of mental health yeah. is uh, what importance and impact do you think nurses have when it comes to uh, you know looking at people or patients' mental health? I think it's absolutely vital. You know, as a mental health nurse, of course, that's in the title of my role. Um, but, you know, we also have learning disability nurses, we have our adult nurses, we have children's nurses, and actually all four fields of nursing. Yes, whilst three of them may seem like they deal with physical health, actually, we all deal with physical and mental health. So for someone who's physically unwell, their mental health will be affected. And for someone who's mentally unwell, their physical health may be affected as well. So actually, as a nurse, it's really vital that we're aware of both physical and mental health. And a lot of the time, um, from you know, looking at things in, in like researching them on my own, um, I've seen that a lot of times, like your physical health can be uh, impacted heavily yeah. by mental health on it. So yeah, I, I suppose nurses have a very large impact on that. Uh, this moving on from that, has you, your has the society, has a nursing society, done anything or planned it to do anything in the future? to aid mental health issues? Yeah, at the, at the moment, um, I suppose we're, in the past, we've had wellbeing events um, for our uh, society members. Um, and again, depending on how things change in the future as to when we can get together and, and stuff like that, obviously, you know, we'll, we'll be looking towards doing some kind of wellbeing events. But sometimes, actually, especially as a student and especially as a nursing student, because that's a very different role to being a, a university student, you know, actually, sometimes just having some form of a connection. So whether that be seeing other students on placement or, you know, we've had a couple of quizzes online. And again, it's just engaging with people and knowing that there's someone out there and other nursing students, because you know, I don't know if you know much about kind of how our course runs, but our courses, our, our year, our academic year is longer than the normal um, kind of university student. You know, um, we're, we're out on placement for 50 percent of our courses. And a lot of that time when we're on placements, actually, a lot of the students are off on reading weeks, holidays, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So it can be really isolating to um to be a nursing student and not to be able to get involved in a normal university student life i suppose well what's normal at the moment but you know what i mean so as i say at the minute we're trying to do as much as we can but i think a lot of our work is actually done on a one-to-one so when individuals contact us with queries concerns and stuff like that and actually we support them on that one-to-one basis and then i think that information gets passed out or that support gets passed out to their peers Right. I mean, that, that kind of uh, you kind of answered my next question, which was uh, being in, you know, being a nursing student, you spend a lot of time at the ho- uh, hospital yourself. Mm-hmm. Right. So I was going to ask, how would you say that has impacted you during this time, you know, mentally and yeah. how do you cope with that? Um, yeah. would you- it, you've got to remember nurse, nursing students and nurses don't just work in hospitals. They work out in the community as well. Right. Um, and actually, we've had nursing students 
working um, throughout the summer in paid placements during the initial COVID kind of crisis. Um, and and we've, so we've had some out there, but then also we've had the other students who haven't been able to go out on placement because of, you know, whether that be health issues or family issues or that kind of stuff. And they've actually been continuing their education throughout the summer. So they've been, I suppose, studying the year ahead. So if I look at my cohort, um, you know, our, we've just started third year, whereas my, um, my friends who couldn't opt into placement, they did their lit review. So they did their third year lit review over the summer whilst we were on placement. And now they've come back and they've gone straight out on placement whilst we're doing the theory block that they did over the summer. Um, so, you know, it's going to impact on everyone's mental health in different ways. For some people, the working through, the being useful, being helpful, um, you know, all of that will be positive for their mental health. But also, you know, for other people, not being able to be helpful, not being able to go on placement during COVID, not being able to opt in, as it was called, actually, that might be detrimental to their mental health. Um you know, and so there's all of that. And then we've also got to remember that a lot of my colleagues in the probably the, the, the general hospitals have probably seen people die of COVID or being very, very unwell, or they've supported families who've had loved ones die of COVID. So that actually is going to have quite a big impact on people's mental health. Um, you know, so it's stuff that we don't think about. And I suppose the university probably doesn't, doesn't think about that much until someone says it to you. And like studying in that like environment as well, it's got yeah. me to, it's tougher than ever. And it, I mean, nursing is tough to begin with in the first yeah, place. You know what? It's one of the hardest things I've done, and you're not wrong. Yeah. And then you add, you add kind of COVID, you add all the pressures onto that, and then you also think, yeah, I've still got to do my academic work as well yeah. as got, got you know, and... out those courseworks as well and everything. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Can't 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 be doing that. Much easier degree for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what sort of solutions would you suggest from a medical and clinical standpoint of view uh, to people in general to dealing and coping with mental health, especially as a student? Yeah, um, I think it, I, you know, the way you say medical and clinical, that kind of makes me think of a medical model of care. And, you know, and we're now looking more towards a holistic model of care. So, you know, so, but moving away from that, actually, what I'd be encouraging everyone to do, regardless of what you're studying, is maintain the contacts that you've got you know um i didn't even know what zoom and teams were before this crisis you know i'm um and you know and but actually i've been connecting with my friends all over the world things that actually we didn't do before covid um you know but connecting with people making sure that you check in on your friends but i think more importantly and it can be really difficult when you're at home and you've got all your coursework to do and kind of nothing else to do and actually to do too much. So, you know, taking a break, doing all the stuff that we see all over social media and, and in the press, you know, get a bit of exercise, get a bit of fresh air, um, you know, that kind of, and suppose do as much as you can outdoors and I know the weather's coming in and all of that kind of stuff, but you've got to think if people are around UEA, UEA is beautiful to go for a walk around, you know, around the lake up around the broads. I'm lucky enough I've got a dog so my my dog I've got to go out and take him out and actually he's what kind of saves my mental health um so yeah don't be too hard on yourself connect with people and if if you're feeling if you feel that things are getting too much talk to someone whether that be a friend someone else on your course someone of your lecturers or you've got student services and nightline as well as all of the national kind of you know the Samaritans and the local um, mental health trust have got a crisis line as well that you can phone if you're feeling that things are getting a bit too much for you. So please just talk to people. Don't keep it bottled up. Yes, but I, I can really agree with you more there. Like, so to wrap it all up, <laughs> uh, I'd say, could you give us uh, a fun fact uh, to do with mental health or nursing that most <laughs> people might not know about? I know I'm putting you on the spot there. <laughs> Any 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 fun fact? Any like medical or nursing or anything related to mental health? Oh God, you put me right on the you put me right on the spot. You can't think of anything that's absolutely I fun. Can't. A fun fact, uh, yeah. What what <laughs> at the minute? It's really oh, difficult to think. In general. Yeah. Um. <laughs> do you know what? You know, you you've got me stumped on that one. 
All right, no, no. <laughs> Sorry about that. Nice little fun thing to end on, but uh, it's, it's it's absolutely fine if you can't. Um, you can message me later, and it'll be yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll share it around or something. <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for your time, Lou. I really appreciate no it. Problem. Yeah. Uh, all right. Right. And we're back. You see, I just do that every time now. I think that's the best way. You haven't muted me, Phil, and I hope everyone can hear me. I can't believe that he keeps on doing this. He seems to want to to mute the most. <laughs> like, I don't know why he does this, but yeah. Thank you very much to Taz Weeb from UEA TV for conducting the interview with Lou O'Connell mm. from Nursing Society. Um, this will be the second time that Lou has joined us for the 24-hour live stream to talk on behalf of Nursing Society, so thank you. Um, so, well, now we've got a bit of light in here. We're, it seems to be that we're, we're heading into the, the evening part quite of things, there, yeah. although we're not quite <laughs> there yet. We've got, we've got about um, a little bit of time Yeah, but got an hour and a half so left until jump. this afternoon segment is done, and then we do the evening session, which starts from 6 o'clock until uh, I've forgotten when it's some ridiculous uh, isn't it uh, until yes 11 that's right is the evening section which George will be uh, co-hosting slash doing the vision mixing for <laughs> um, yeah but for now just remember that we are still absolutely. raising money for Norwich Nightline so please if you haven't already uh, Jake told us that even if just six percent of the UEA student population donated just one pound then we would reach our target so literally please just you know a pound that you would have spent on um, yeah. uh, a mean, chocolate bar nothing. or I mean or wait I mean you know because all of the bars are closed you know if you would have been going to the bar or the pub and getting a pint you know the, the cost of a pint <laughs> Um, is whatever you can. I don't think it is. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I know no, student no, bars are cheap, you know, but that's options. ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but some options. But anyway, before we <laughs> before we digress, uh, we're going to introduce the the next interview that was pre-recorded about a month ago by Gemma from Hedgecate, and she was joined by a postgraduate researcher and Hedgecate member as well, Amy Zeal, who loves to do arts and crafts and stitching to help with her mental health and they met up to talk about that so okay hi everybody i hope you're enjoying the 24-hour live uh, my name's Gemma, and i'm with the hedgecate society and i'm talking to amy zile about her phd work but also more importantly about her personal experiences with arts and crafts and how they really help with her mental well-being um thanks very much for joining me amy Oh, thank you for, for having me. So you started your PhD in January, is that right? Yep. Yeah, and came to Norwich about a, a, a month later. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about the the focus of your PhD and uh, the, the, the particular element of psychiatry that you're really interested in? Yep, so um, my PhD is looking at a PhD student mental health. Um, I've previously done some work on general student mental health, um, but I know that PhD students are a very unique group and um, many are older with families or balancing teaching, other employment, coming from industry. Um, so my PhD research is looking at uh, PGR mental health, the impact of the supervisory relationship mm -hmm. and how discussions or disclosures of mental health are perceived by PGR students and their supervisors in the research environment and what universities can do to ensure that both students and staff feel comfortable and supported in talking about them as well. That's great. And I, I, we, we have talked a little bit prior to this interview and you, you mentioned about how, you know, you're looking at things like policies and practices that the that universities can put in place for their students to help them out. Um, but the thing that we're really interested in today, um, as, as important as that is and, and, and as, a, as significant as it is as a really good starting block and building block for student well-being in a huge, huge community like the UEA, is the sort of personal responsibility that people can take in their own hands and and do to help with their own well-being um which is the the sort of hobby that you've you've developed 
for yourself and, and to, to recommend to others. Um, I believe it was, it's uh, embroidery and cross stitch particularly for you, but we're, we're obviously going to talk about um, how crafts of any kind can help. But can you talk a little bit for us about um, the, how you get in, got into the embroidery and the cross stitch and the crafts that you particularly enjoy? That would be really great. Yep, so um, originally it, it sort of started on a whim. Um, my mum moved into a new house and I wanted to make her something to say, you know, new home, home sweet home, this mm. is your space. Um, and I came across a cross stitch kit and I thought, oh, I'll give it a go. And I really, really enjoyed it. And then from starting cross stitching, I then branched out into embroidery. Um, and for those who don't know, Cross stitching is technically a part of embroidery, as cross stitch is, is an embroidery stitch. Mm -hmm. But um, cross stitch generally you follow a pattern. It's almost like painting by numbers, but with thread. Mm -hmm. And embroidery, you can follow patterns as well, but it uses a lot of different stitches, textures. And in my experience, you have a lot more free reign in terms of color choices and just what you do with the fibers. Yeah. Yeah, so you've, you've, you've got one that's uh, clearly more guided and uh, and more structured and the other one a little bit more creative in that sense. I mean, how, did, had you done cross-stitch before you, you did this thing for, you, for your mum or was, it, was this brand new, let's give it a go kind of experiment? Yeah, it was completely brand new. Um, I mean, I had some experience of in textiles at school we had to make a pencil case um mm. and i'd previously attempted to use a sewing machine um, <laughs> which didn't go very well um so did you sew your own machine. fingers though or did I, you manage did you manage to avoid sewing your own fingers <laughs> just about there were some very near misses see i'd um, consider that a success in the use of a sewing machine <laughs> um yeah, so I went for the sort of proper hands-on, mm -hmm. just my hands and needles and thread and see, <laughs> see what my hands want to create with it. I think that's great. I think it's a lovely sort of creative way to go about it. Um, in, and I think it's really important to point out the fact that you hadn't had any re real um, sort of, it wasn't like you'd been doing cross stitch for 10 years or, or anything like that, because I know that there are a lot of people who, when they're in a, in a poor state of mental health, they sort of sit there and think, I, I can't do this craft because I haven't had practice or I haven't had lessons or I don't have the right equipment or all of these sort of um, barriers that there are to arts and crafts is that something you would encourage people to try and steer away from and, and to try and uh, prove prove wrong do you think yeah definitely I mean I'm completely self-taught so I just made it all up as I went along and then realized oh this this technique has a name this stitch has a name <laughs> this is something that you know has a, a way of doing it even if my way isn't quite that way but there are so many good sort of online youtube and um, like photo based tutorials if people do want to take the more rigid sort of i'm going to learn how to do this stitch and this stitch and then i can apply them or people can just do what i did and sort of make it up as you go along and see what you like and what you don't like and um, even now there are many many stitches that i i don't know i don't use but there are you know a handful that i'm very comfortable with and can create a lot with those mm. uh, so i think if people are are worried about being a, a newbie to the task you know it's we're all new at something in our lives um you know we've got a a little niece and when she was learning to walk i was just tried to apply that to my crafting and my life you know she didn't fall down and go oh, I'm not going to walk anymore just give up <laughs> it was part of the learning process and I think especially with with crafting it teaches you a lot about making mistakes that it's okay to make mistakes mm. you can just unpick them how to learn from the mistakes and even how to incorporate mistakes and things that you perceive as being the wrong way to do things into something that the end product you and other people really enjoy and you can't see the mistakes anymore yeah absolutely and i i often find sometimes if uh, if, if i've created anything it, when when it gets shown to someone else they, they can't 
see the things that I can and it, even if I've made small mistakes and I get really insecure about them they don't notice them at all have you found that yeah definitely I mean we're always our our own worst critic and mm -hmm. it can be the case with a lot of creative pursuits where you know I sit there stitching and I'm looking at something very close to my face I can see every detail and then I show somebody across the room or put a picture of it online and they can't see anything wrong with it because they're looking at the whole picture mm. and I've been so hyper focused on some of the details and I think as well you know I've given pieces I've stitched as gifts that have had mistakes in it nobody's noticed they've mm. just thought it was part of the the end product and it means as well because with things like embroidery and cross stitch you can get kits that have you know patterns to follow and places where you should put this stitch or this color and I've made mistakes on them but it means that of all the people in the world that have stitched that landscape or that particular Pokemon or anything <laughs> like that mine's completely unique yeah. um, the mistakes have been part of it and it's been part of my my creative process. I, I love that as a, as a concept of, of sort of how mental health should be in, in the long run. I mean, I know that in my personal experience that, that there are a lot of people who suffer from poor mental health because they have a need to, to have everything be perfect and to, and to not make mistakes, not fail at anything. Um, and, and they feel great shame if, if, if anything happens in that way. But I love the, the idea that when you work on a craft, you can teach yourself the experience of making those mistakes and it not being a big deal. Um, do you think that's a really nice metaphor for, for mental health? Like look at the big picture almost rather than not, not the little things. Yeah, definitely. Like I know if I was to ask any of my friends or family who have received one of my pieces or even people from the amazing online communities that are out there in the crafting world, what they, if they could describe my, embroidery or my stitching none of them would say oh it's full of mistakes they'd say oh it's it's creative and it's beautiful and you made this yourself so you know that's really important to sort of keep in mind and um, especially when you're working on a bigger project I mean I did a very large cross stitch piece while I was doing my master's dissertation and it was a learning process that they fed into one another. I would make mistakes on the cross stitch and then step back and say, oh, okay, that you actually can't tell when you aren't mm. staring at it super up close. And then the same with my master's work. Like I'd get feedback and it'd be like, okay, I've made this mistake, but it doesn't mean that the entire dissertation mm. is bad. It just means that this one tiny bit needs a tweak or I've got this tiny bit wrong and actually it didn't affect the end result of either the cross stitch piece or my dissertation yeah so you so your craft effectively taught you not to catastrophize these these smaller errors and to and to be able to go go on with your day without them being de debilitating to you in that way um yeah. I, I love that you mentioned about the communities that um you've been a part of online and stuff because i think a lot of people think of, of crafts as something you do privately you know you you paint or you draw or you stitch or wh whatever and you're on your own um, I, I love the idea of a, a society that's built around it. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. So um, I started posting my stitches to Instagram and that then also led me to create a Tumblr. Um, more just to have a record of what I was doing and mm -hmm. things that I didn't sort of want to, to put on my other social media where I had family and things. Yeah. Um, and just almost like as a, a record of my progress. and. There's so many amazing crafters out there. I've met people from all over the world, um, especially in the sort of last couple of months with the lockdown and everything. It's been a really mm. invaluable resource because so many of us have both used crafting and also sort of encountered people who are, are new to the craft because everybody was sort of stuck at home and saying, OK, I want to do something creative. Um, so I'll see what else is going on. And, found these brilliant communities where there's so much support and again none of them see the flaws in my work that I might see everybody's incredibly encouraging and supportive and we've built real communities done some charity fundraising auctioning off our pieces wow. um, yeah in um, earlier this year one of 
our embroidery community and um, sadly lost her husband to sarcoma and mm-hmm. um, 30 of us got together and held a charity raffle and raised over two thousand pounds for sarcoma uk and um, just making pieces and auctioning them off so it can be a really re- rewarding community both for me personally and also to give back and support other creators and mm-hmm. um, I'm really glad that I engaged in these communities um, and yeah, I've made some lifelong friends that I've never met, but we've sent each other pieces and there's, you know, you can do craft swaps and there was a a jacket that we auctioned off for charity where I think it was a hundred people made a patch for it and they were all put onto the jacket and then that was auctioned off in the US to support um, Planned Parenthood. And so there's so much outreach and community there. You just have to, just have mm-hmm. to look for it. I, when I first picked up a needle and thread, I never thought that I'd be where I am now with the connections and the friends that I've made. But I'm so glad that I did. Mm. I, I love the idea that I mean, as, as much as charity work is is amazing and it's all, you know, it's always great to support to support worthy causes. I, I I just can't help but think what what this uh, this woman who obviously lost her husband. Um, must have been feeling to have so many people sort of step up and be supportive in that way. I love the idea that the the, the craft in itself is almost obsolete and not, not to disregard any of your efforts at all, but it's more a case of the the, the, the social element of these communities and the, the craft being a case of just bringing everybody together. Do you, do you find that's the case? You, do you talk about your own lives and, and sort of, I don't want to say in quote real issues, but you know, do, do you help support each other in that sense as well, do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm in a couple of group chats that I definitely wouldn't have got through the lockdown without having just moved to a new city and a new university. I didn't really get the chance to sort of meet many people before everything came to a stop. Um, and so having those communities, especially such a international community, you know, if I wake up in the middle of the night and my head's really loud, I can just go online and talk to people. And mm. yeah, the only thing we had in common at first was that we were creative but we've learned so much about one another and supported each other through so much and even supported each other into branching out into other crafts like one of the people I knew from stitching now makes clay earrings and I bought a little animal crossing pendant for my rucksack some of them do paper art it's almost like that gateway into seeing what other people are doing with their creativity Mm. and their expression and going, oh, maybe I'll try that as well, if they can do it. Maybe I I can too. So thanks very much for that, Amy. I'm I'm gonna have to draw the conversation to a close now because uh, we've uh, exceeded the 15 minutes, I think, that was our allocation, Um, which is a shame because I'm enjoying talking to you and I think it's a a really great topic to, to discuss. Um, so we've talked a little bit about, you know, the, the communities that can be formed through these crafts and, and the social element and the support you can find on a, on a, a basis between them. We've also talked about um, personal uh, development from it, you know, understanding that mistakes get made, learning self-compassion and, and resilience and perseverance and creating these things that give us the warm fuzzies, which should never be underestimated in the power that they have. Um, so the last thing I sort of really wanted to just touch on was, you know, if there's somebody who's who's watching this interview and thinks, oh, I've I've, ne- I've never done a craft before. It sounds interesting, but I've, I've never painted. I've never done a- any kind of hands on craft, um, but I am sort of struggling a little bit. I am quite stressful. I would like something to take my mind off of things. What would you say would be sort of the first step for them? Um, in going forward and being able to be a part of these communities or or, or pick up a craft? I'd say um, to just try and get rid of any inhibitions about your ability, your skill level, your talent, and just just go for it. I mean, art is inherently about expression. Um, So whatever you express, whatever you create is personal to you. And if it gets things out of your head and onto paper or canvas or in my case fabric then to just give it a go I mean all I did to start embroidery was get an old pillowcase a needle and some thread and it just blossomed from there and you don't need fancy equipment there are many many great tutorials and things out there if you do want to learn in a structured way Um, 
and if you want to join communities then then just search things like hashtag embroidery or hashtag cross stitch on instagram um, or facebook or any other there hasn't been a social media network that i haven't found a crafting community on so yeah just go and have a look go and see what other people are creating maybe you'll get some inspiration and just give it a go i love that give, give it a go i think i think that's a message that a lot of people can take for their mental health ac across the board you know try and let go of any small mistakes try and let go of any stumbles and just give it a go yeah. all right thank you very much amy i've really enjoyed talking to you today no problem thanks bye And we're back. Yay. Thank you so much to our lovely educators, Amy and Gemma, for that lovely little segment about art, craft, and mental health. It was mm -hmm. lovely, lovely to hear. And it sounds like you guys had a lovely chat. Woo! How are we doing? How, How are we getting, getting on? on? I, I, How many hours? It's, it's been quite a show, hasn't it, really, so far? I'm, I'm still, we, we're still chugging along nicely. I would like to hear more about people's input i don't know if anybody watching has been making comments on the on the various platforms that we are streaming on uh but please do let us know if you've got any thoughts about the content that we've got yeah. um if there's other things you particularly like i mean we're always planning for other shows um and so if you go oh no could we have more of this and less of that i can't guarantee we can have it in the next 24 hours because it takes a bit of planning but um <laughs> We can certainly consider it for future shows, yeah, if, uh, whether it's, I mean, not necessarily MH24 Live 2021, which I'm assuming is going to be a thing. I won't be president then, but we... Oh, <laughs> who knows? Um, but, yeah, if, if anyone is watching, um, we would love to hear from you. Like, I'm trying to follow some of the streams that's going on. I'm trying to follow the watch party comments. Um, I'm trying to also have a look at the Twitch as well when I can, but it's really hard. But if you're if you are watching, like shout out, oh, yeah. say hey to us, and remember to hashtag us um, and hashtag MH24 Live, and we will be like picking everything up from there. And hopefully, it, when we get a little bit of time later on this evening, when there's a little bit of a breather, we can have a look through and see what everyone's been saying. And hopefully, we've got some selfies. I'm hoping that we've got some pets out there that are watching, so we'd love to see that. I really hope that my blodgy that, is just watching. Just to clarify, still. your blodgy being your cat, I believe. Yes, I, yes, I, That yes, wasn't yes, clear. Yes, yes. I don't but, think everybody knows but, the name of your cat, you see. Let's yeah, let's let's swim past that part. But yeah, we we want to know. Um, we let's let's kind of uh, take take note and just like take a breather and think about everything that we've already seen today because it's been we, loads. So if we start right back at the beginning, we spoke to Jake, who is the external coordinator of Norwich Nightline, and he told us a little bit about why we're fundraising for them, what they do, and all that jazz. And we'll be hearing again from Jake a little bit later. He'll be joining us. Um. I can't remember exactly what time. He's going to be joining us a fair little bit throughout, um, but especially at the last hour from 8 till 9 o'clock in the morning on Sunday, he'll be joining us to kind of finish off the stream with a bang. Uh, and that will be yeah. me, Jake and Phil. Start as we ended. Um, no and end then, as we started. Yeah, and so... So, and if anyone does want to go back and watch the morning and they've missed it, you can still catch that. That's still on uh, Facebook and Twitch as like yeah. uh, past kind of played events so you can still catch all of that there um and the next thing that we had 9 30 we showed the interview with the vice chancellor professor david richardson and we did that um about a month ago we met with him that was really great and if you missed that that's really nice to watch because i don't think we really get a lot of like face-to-face -face, um chat with the vice chancellor and he kind of he runs the university and so, yeah, it's nice to have a bit mm -hmm. of a check-in with him. Yeah, and so, I mean, I could keep going through. Do you remember uh, what, what was it, 10 o'clock, have... That was your favourite Oh, uh, 10 o'clock was part. the... Oh, gosh, yes, the keep fit thing, the workout. <laughs> um, I yeah, mean, we... we also had the, the, the chant by the angels as well. We mustn't forget that. That was very good. That was cute. We did. Uh, and then, but then we had the workout for half an hour, which was exhausting just to watch to be honest with you but it was very very well put together and very i'm very you know um proud of everybody who's contributed to the show but 
Uh, that particularly, I thought, came together really nicely. Um, then after that, we had yeah, the, the so Nightline Bear, which was nice to see. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's really good to see that there's so many sort of different ways of tackling mental health. And it's not, you know, we're not just aiming at one sort of uh, way of looking at it. It's not just discussion shows. It's not just, you know, interviews. We've got, you know, sport. And then we've got, you know, cute things like Nightline Bear. And then we've got politics with Clive Lewis, who came in at 10 to 11. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we it's, it's been a packed schedule. And that's that's not even the morning, I think. I don't know. There, 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 there was all this stuff... <laughs> in the afternoon which is now coming uh yeah. well, well we've still got some things left to go for the afternoon we've, we've got um yeah. coming up very shortly we've got ethan lyons the president of asd society talking about the the crossover between autism and mental health um and then after that we've got sort of um history of of mental health uh from uh lucy and mirabelle um as um I think Mirabelle will be there, and Lucy Mirabelle wrote it, or we will see. Um, that we're, this is going to be a live thing, so we uh, we're going to be surprised by what that's going to be, but we're looking forward to it. Um, then after that, mm-hmm. we've got um, the Labour Society. We've got um, Katie Hicks from the Labour Society talking about where um, politics and and mental health can cross over. So it's it's um, but from a particular. Uh, should we say, uh, opposition politics perspective, should we say, um, I don't know, but it may well be, I blame the Tories for basically 15 minutes, but we will, uh, we will find out. Um, and then at <laughs> quarter to six, uh, we will end the afternoon section um, with um, a chat with Alexander Lee all about um, men's mental health and the Movember. Uh, movement that's is that the word uh, the you know the whole organization, organization event it's yeah. Kind of, kind of, yeah it's still going November. on um, I've totally failed yeah uh, no it's it, it, no it's not happening <laughs> no <laughs> um, anyway but yes be- um, uh, so that's that's what we've got coming up and then we've got a whole load of stuff later on as well so. yeah and you can find the schedule if you missed our little debrief there or if there was some things that we didn't mention and there was quite a lot then you can check out the social media pages um, which are at UEA TV for pretty much all of them um, and Hedgecate's Instagram is at Hedgecate underscore UEA so yeah you can find the schedule you can find what we've, we, what we've already had and you can find what's coming up you can find our mm. promo video which was endorsed well, the whole event has been endorsed by Stephen Fry, Greg James, Sean Wallace, Bag of Chips, Ed Balls, Clive Lewis, Sir Norman Lamb. Um, I it, think oh, that was it. it. The seven, and, it? But yes, uh, basically celebrity endorsements, is, we've seen that, you know, right. I think actually what we're doing is, is quite good, actually, and very worth their time. Yeah. Um, and they, they, submit, they sort of contributed a little uh, video to help us along our way. We played all the videos at the beginning, at the top of the show. But I'm sure later on in the evening we will show them again because they are quite good. The Stephen Fry one yeah. being my particular favourite. Um, yeah, it's great. Well, hopefully we will show them again. And don't forget that we are here to raise money for Norwich Nightline. And we still have quite a way to go to get to our target. We still have to get about like 10 times, well, a little bit <laughs> less than 10 times our target. Again, I'm not doing my maths right now very well. But yeah, even if you can just donate one pound, Jake, the external coordinator for Nightline, said that only a 6% of UEA students mm. donated £1, then we would reach our target. So that's what we're aiming to do, just, just £1, and that can go towards helping Nightline with um, funding some more electronics. They, at the moment, only have one functional computer of sorts, and they really need to you know, be able to get back up running yeah. so that they can help support the student community. So anybody who's watching now, I can see that, I, I'm looking here at some statistics, I can see that there is uh, at least, I think about 20 people watching, there may be more, I don't know, this is just on a thing I'm looking at on my screen. So hopefully there's more, this is, um, if all of you just contributed. Yeah, I just got a message, i just shout out to Charlie because he's just messaged me to say yeah. that he's watching so thank you everyone for supporting the stream all 20 of you for now like, it's, it's just what I've got on my screen it's, yeah. it's just on one limited aspect we've got at least 20 in that bit um, so if those 20 people are now watching you just go into the SU uh, 
uh, website. Hopefully you're all students. If you're not, you can just create a guest. And then you purchase a product that will donate um, fixed amounts that you can choose. Um, I would aim at the bigger end. That's That would be good. Uh, we, <laughs> go on. No, just whatever, whatever you can, you can afford. afford um, just, just a little amount um, because we really would love to help mm. Norwich Nightline. It is Nightline Awareness Week yes. this week. So we are trying to, as much as raise funds, also raise awareness. So also please share the stream. Let people know that you're watching. Tweet it. Share it. Um, Periscope. Everything. YouTube, we're on all the Facebook. social medias, everything that we could think of. Yeah. Um, if there's any platform that we're not on, do let us know and we'll figure out a way of doing it. I know we can't live stream to Instagram. <laughs> Apart from but Instagram it's the only one live, we can't do because yeah. it doesn't work. You know, you do that on your phone and this is not a phone yeah. thing. Anyway. Anyway, I'm digress. Digress. Now so let's should we move on to the next item? Yeah. Let, let's introduce Absolutely. our next guest. Thank you. <laughs> we are delighted to be joined today by Ethan Lyons who is the president of ASD Society, or Autism Spectrum Disorder Society. So welcome to join us. Thanks for joining us doing? today. How are you doing yeah, today? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thank you, for yeah, good, thank you. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for joining us. No, thank um, you for joining it's really us. Great um, it's really great to um, have you. I know that... Um, um, I know that um, ASD Society new, is quite new, isn't it? Yeah, so we, yeah, so so we joined UEA last so year. I joined UEA last um, year. So I, I, um, so I started setting uh, it up within my first year. Setting it up within my first year. It was sort of, and then it was sort of, of my at the start of my, you know, this academic year. So that we, my second year, year really that we started really operating, really started operating as a society, you know, and stuff. With events and stuff. Yeah, it's great, and yeah, I mean, it's great, it's and a, I mean, surprise, I guess, bit of a surprise, I guess, there. that wasn't already there. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, yeah it's uh, you know, I got, uh, here, last I I got here last year, and I was sort of looking for a space. For, I know a space, you know, for, autistic people, um, you know, autistic people, because um, you know, I've because you know, I've um, I've got Asperger's, and, and I couldn't find any society, and I couldn't groups. find any societies so or groups. I just thought, you know, so I just thought, you know, I'll set one up myself, and you know, create a you know, student, friendly, a, you know, student friendly, 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 autism friendly space. Yeah, yeah. Well, when you say an autism friendly Bill. space, how would you just define that? What is the what makes a space an autism friendly one? So, so. I'd say an autism friendly space. I'd say an autism friendly about space is allowing about allowing people to people to it's it's, it's giving people it's the giving people the ability to feel comfortable enough ability to feel comfortable enough their to share their opinions use and their voice to talk use about their voice to talk about anything they want to or anything they anything they to want about. to or anything they need we to talk about with so our society group chat. We have within our society we group chat provide a little space we for provide a little space people for to Feel comfortable people to feel comfortable in the knowledge that everybody else in that group chat will understand them, or at least have some idea of what they're going through. Of, you know what they're going through. You know, and, and when people you know, talk and about when people issues, other, other people can have you know, you know relate, relate with sympathy, sympathy and, and you know, you know essentially it just comes down to feeling comfortable, comfortable to talk, talk and share, and share especially about, about any mental health issues or any sort of emotional things people are going through because. I think, I it's, think very, it's very, very important, important to talk about, about these things. things. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and, and I think it's, I think it's really, really nice that, that you've, you've managed, managed to do it. Do it. So, so well done. Well done. I, know I know it's not just you uh, on, the on the committee, so I know you've got um, a few, few kind of people, people helping, helping with it. With it. So it's great, great that you've got your little, your little community. Yeah, thank you. What kind of things you have planned? I mean, if you've got any plans, kind of share with us for the future. So, so this, this as, a as a society right now, right now we're kind of focusing on peer support, peer support aspects of you know you know peer, peer support, support services. services. So any members or anybody out there who's looking to join, we have we have uh, members group uh, chat, members group chat where, as I've where as I've mentioned, mentioned any, people can talk about any you know talk about you know talk about any mental health issues or any you know any emotional things they're going through or you know. Even if they just want to find people who relate, the point is, you know, that's a space for you guys that you can talk talk freely in. Um, but so we're doing um, weekly video sessions. So we're talking about like allowing people to share their thoughts in a more verbal, personal way, or at least as personal as we can get right now. About you know 
how you're feeling and how people are coping because we think that the pandemic is a especially difficult time if you're on the autism spectrum and you're you know you've got another comorbid condition like depression or something because you know those negative feelings that can come with depression you know i don't have it myself so i can't possibly understand but those negative feelings that come with depression alongside the issues connecting with people that we that we see with some autistic people it's it's very important to have you know a space to talk and a an opportunity to uh, speak to people in a face-to-face capacity just like this yeah great and you mentioned that um, especially now during COVID and lockdown, I guess, that things are especially difficult for people with ASD. Um, what kind of things, I mean, it doesn't have to be personal, but what kind of things do you think people are, are struggling with? I'd say, especially if you're a first-year student or you've just joined UEA, um, having transferred or whatever, it's especially difficult to make friends in online lectures because When you can see a person, I think it's a lot easier to predict the flow of conversation. You can, although the flow of conversation is difficult, you can still predict it a lot easier. Whereas when you're discussing things over a camera or over a video chat, it's a little bit faceless. And well, it's faceless for everybody, but the faceless aspect of it means that people don't, you don't necessarily know when you have broken a social boundary. So if you're talking too much about, I don't know, how much you like, how much you enjoy learning about like DNA and stuff, then people, there's, there'll be no cues there to know that you're bored. So it's, I'd say it's a, it's, it's a social challenge more than anything. And of course, there's the aspects of isolation and the pandemic doesn't help connect generally, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, and what kind of advice would you give to someone that felt like, I don't know, kind of overwhelmed by the pandemic? The advice I'd give is obviously to try and engage with as many peer support communities such as ours. You know, as a group, we're quite open. You don't have to be autistic. You don't have to have a diagnosis to be in the group. Or, you know, we don't mind. We're just looking to help, you know, raise awareness of the condition. So, you know, if we have somebody who's not got the condition and they join the group then they have and they start talking to people they have a much better idea of how they can accommodate because i personally feel that university is a kind of a launching point for many people's careers so by having the society as big as we can possibly have it we can have more people understand what autism's like so then when they go into their working lives they can help understand you know, understand autistic people better. So, you know, hypothetically, say we had a person join and, you know, they ended up becoming, I don't know, like head of a company, you know, when they're interviewing people, they can really understand that eye contact may be an issue or verbal um, ability may be a little bit lacking, shall we say. Um, But yeah, so no, I definitely recommend joining peer support groups and you know, trying to connect with people online as much as you can, of course. Yeah, definitely. And um, as you said, um, you've got the group chat um, and things like that. So um, if people wanted to join that, how could they kind of get get involved? So we have a Facebook page. Um, I The name escapes me, but it will be something like UEA ASD Society. I'm pretty sure it's, so that's UEA ASD Society, and I'm 90% sure that's what it is. Um, but I can send that over properly later. But um, so we're, you know, as a committee, we're quite responsive to any messages on that page, and we will happily add people from that page. I'm just trying to find. No, yeah, it's UEA Autism Society. So, or just Autism Society. Um, yeah, so just message the page, and we can add you to the chat. So anybody who's interested, please feel free. At the moment, we're not going to be very strict on membership fees. So if money's an issue, then that's perfectly understandable. But um, as I said, yeah, just please join if you're interested. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and how's, um, 
has like university been I mean as you you kind of mentioned for some people with ASD that they might have a comorbid condition or have like an, another for example a mental health condition as well um what do you think kind of the the overlap might be or or do you think that there is kind of any any correlation there so I don't remember the figures from top of my head, but there's been many studies which have linked autism with conditions like depression and anxiety. But you kind of have to think about how autism interacts with stuff like depression. So, for example, um, say you're dealing with a lot of negative emotions associated with depression. So, you know, sadness and that sort of extreme sadness, of course. It may be difficult for the autistic person to explain the way they feel in a way that's clear. And it may be a challenge to go and talk to the doctor. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I use the word may a lot because doing the job that I do as society president, you really see how it is actually a spectrum. So there's a vast range of abilities and there's a vast range of ways that autism can possibly interact but there'll be three main ways um, that somebody will have, you know, that somebody will suffer, right? You don't have to have all three, but you have like, so someone maybe have a rigid routine. So there'll be like a need for, um, you know, patterns in their lives. So if you're depressed um, and you're autistic and you've got a need for a pattern, it might make it difficult to establish a pattern. So the depression might, hurt the ability to establish your pattern so then you're going to end up with a lot of I don't know I suppose double annoyance I can't think of the right word for it but discomfort yeah so you end up sort of double discomfort because you can't establish a routine and of course it's the social difficulties which as I said you can't really you may not be able to explain to the doctor very well and another aspect of it is um special interest so some people on the spectrum not all some have kind of interests within psychology not within my personally is within psychology but they'll have interests in many things like you know different things like i don't know anime cartoons anything right and if you're autistic it'd be very easy to fall into reading those reading about those things and engaging with the topic to the detriment of looking after your own mental health or discussing it so there's a potential danger of over reliance on your own, um, you know, it may become a pathological coping skill. So. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I'm kind of in my, I'm in my training to be, to be a doctor. So for me, like something that I'm really interested in is like the importance of like communication and trying to like keep a, like an open space and trying to understand someone like regardless of kind of whether they're, on the spectrum or or whatever like being able to um communicate can be difficult um for people that have um like difficulty communicating with their their words and um i just think it's such a important thing especially as we're talking about like mental health and being able to express ourselves as well hmm. i'd say i'd say to any medical or aspiring medical practitioner or any medic in training to I suppose anxiety and the fear of being misunderstood or wanting to be understood won't help with the communication. So trying to create um, an anxiety free space, you know, like putting them, putting people at ease or putting a patient at ease in which you think they may have a developmental issue, kind of like autism. It's just about, as I say, it comes down to making people feel comfortable as much as you can. You, you will never, get there 100 percent but as an individual it's just good to try as much as you can but it all i say it also comes down to which of course if you study medicine you probably know it's about actively listening to the patient so instead of when the patient describes their problem instead of just thinking right it could be this this and this as they're talking you listen to them fully and you let them explain themselves until they feel like they're done and then you and then you kind of sort of address the problem. So it's, as I say, these are basic communication skills, which if practiced can really go a long way with helping you deal with autistic people. 
but not just autistic people. It can help you deal with just general patients and, you know, any member of the public, really. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, of course. No, yeah, definitely. Uh, it's a very good point you raised, actually. I think as well as being clear and listening, it's about autistic people sometimes will take things literally. So, yeah, so, so for example, it's a really cliched example, but if you say it's raining cats and dogs, someone may deliberately like think you're, think they're being serious, um, which... It's as silly as it sounds, it can happen. So it's about being completely clear. So if you need them to take, you know, X amount of doses at morning and night, you'll say, right, um, take it at nine o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the uh, afternoon. So it's just about being as clear and possibly explicit as you can be, you know, as a, yeah. you know, as a medical practitioner. Yeah, and thank you for the, the advice of that. Yeah, no problem, no problem. Um, I don't know if I've still got internet. No, yeah, you're still here as far as I know. Yeah, it's still fine for me. Um, I don't know if anyone heard me earlier. Apparently I was on mute, but uh, yeah, I was just... I, I think Ethan answered what I was saying anyway. Yeah, I could hear you, yeah. Yeah, you could hear me, but I'm thinking from a streaming perspective, and I was on mute for a moment there, apparently. Uh, but yeah, all I was doing was 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 setting up the question that Ethan said, which was about being clear and um, in 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 yeah in in every way that couldn't be misunderstood. Because I I'm, my understanding of ASD is it's quite easy to misunderstand things, and then it's that conflict between what you find acceptable, as in this is the way things are, and you've misunderstood something so that it isn't that, and and it's that tension between the difference between the way that you find it acceptable or the not just the way but you know the the, the acceptable like things should be within certain parameters and the, oh you've misunderstood something and it's not and that's that can it's very easy for ASD people to uh get very anxious am I right I mean it, it, it's 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 not just about the misunderstanding but it, it's very easy for ASD people to to get very caught up in the in the in in the in yeah small it, details yes well that's true yeah. but also the, the 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 it's very easy to get to, to suffer from from mental health issues simply because you've got caught up in a small detail that could ultimately be ignored but it's like no it doesn't work it doesn't fit within the the frame of world that i understand the world should be in if you see what i mean i mean yeah. I, it, it, obviously the shape of the world varies depending on your, how you know how you've up interpreted things up to this point but you d does that make any any sense at all yeah i think i get what you mean yeah i mean my, so, yeah i think people i think it's very easy to if you suspect you're you know you're dealing with depression or anxiety it's important to go and speak to a doctor instead of being so rigid about oh i don't fit this criteria i don't fit this criteria it's it's about how it's about how you feel. So you have to assess: Am I feeling good, good in my life, and am I okay? Essentially, you know, that's essentially it's all it comes to. But um, yeah, it's just about I don't know. It's just about being caring, empathetic, and understanding. And it's just about you know, um, for autistic people, it's about trying to learn to communicate where you can, because obviously that's going to be very helpful. But it falls on medical practitioners as well as 
them to try and create a good dialogue. Um, and that's all I really wanted to I, say, really. I would also add that it's not just medical practitioners who need to be more understanding. That's the whole thing about ASD yeah. awareness, is that neurotypical people, as in people who don't have autism, they need to be aware that there are people out there who do think differently, and that's all it is. It's just a reprogramming. It's just a slightly different... It's a Mac rather than a PC. It is just a different yeah. setup. Um, of course, of course. And obviously, yeah, Macs are better, obviously. I'm doing this on a Mac. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, we can agree to disagree. But thank you, <laughs> Ethan, for joining us. I just wanted to let you know before we say goodbye to you that I've been chatting on the Twitch to one of our viewers who is also uh, one of our performers a little bit later on, Nav. And she's joined the Facebook page, but she'd love to get into the group chat. So um, I will let her know to get in contact with you. If that's all right. Yeah, just just uh, just message the play. Uh, sorry, message the page, and we will. will I'll add you to the group chat. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ethan, for joining us. We will move swiftly on. Before we do, just um, a really cheeky shout out to my mum who is watching and didn't get her shout out earlier. So hello to the Selwyn family. Thank you for watching. <laughs> um, shall we move yeah, let's, on? let's move on. Sorry, yeah. thank you very much, Ethan. Um, we will so now much. move on. Yeah, so what do we got next? We are really looking forward to this. Um, I have a quite an interest in history of mental health and psychiatry um, as someone that's kind of hoping to get into that as a job, and I've been kind of surrounded in the hospitals by a lot of um, mental healthy stuff that goes back a long time. It's really interesting. So lovely to introduce. Um, is um, it, is Maribel? it Maribel? Uh, Maribel. Uh, Maribel? Yeah, yeah, lovely, lovely. Um, to, to talk, talk to us a little, little bit about the history, the history of mental of health. health. So thanks, so thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, hi everyone. everyone. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, when, when I was, I was like researching mental health, mental health Question I was, question I was thinking, thinking about was, was how is the history of mental health involved in like, like how we how understand, understand it today, basically? And like, and, like general research, research, I did find she likes some, some surprising, surprising things, things, things actually, actually. Which, which I hope you guys would be interested, interested in too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 What did you what find? Did you find? Yeah, yeah, it's like uh, some, uh, of the, some of the, one, one, I, think the I think the most surprising thing I found was that during the 18th century, during like the 18th century, 19th century, there was, there was a bit of movement, of movement mental, mental health movement, movement kind, of kind of to improve, improve treatment, treatment time, really. time really and kind of, and kind of like, think of think people mental illness, illness, illness as like being like, like kind of rational, rational people, people who make their own decisions, decisions. And, and rather than, rather than having, to having to just like, like kind of in the past, in the past like, maybe, like maybe like kind of high the high away society they could be helped helped out helped like kind of re-enter the workforce things like that which I was surprised about was pretty impressive for that time yeah yeah go on go on sorry yeah, yeah. Well, well, I was kind of, kind of I'm kind of, kind of looking, looking at this history of mental health from like kind of a gent history point of view, saying that kind of how kind of like how how like kind of gender roles developed that kind of kind of fed into how mental health was being seen. Basically, I would think kind of like today sometimes like kind of men might men can be kind of nervous about like talking men and women can still be nervous about talking about mental health because they kind of maybe don't seem to take being too emotional or they kind of or like kind of want to be like might like you know it's about like or being like different to everyone else but even though yeah, there is you know it's not better than it used to be but there is still like things to kind of think about and like kind of how kind of past ideas are like kind of helped sort of shade where we are today right I kind of sort of began by sort of like looking at kind of medieval Europe and like kind of how at that time kind of mental illness was understood in several different ways like there was a scientific kind of point of view and like kind of religious point of view the kind of religious point of view was kind of pretty shocking by modern standards was that kind of sort of religious authorities at the time and like the general public kind of thought that if you had had you, if you were experienced mental illness it said something about that you kind of had like a weaker mind or weaker body and that maybe you might be possessed by a devil which is terrible and kind of sort of initially started to create stigma around mental health which is awful and the scientific point of view at the time was kind of sort of similar that if you kind of had like kind of sort of an illness mental or physical your body was like unbalanced kind of 
Yeah. And like kind of, I think in the past, in the medieval period and also the Alimon period, people were very scared of like disorder in any kind of way or danger. So, yeah. To, yeah. Just like to add to the points that you made about um, religion and stigma, there's still... Um, in some religions there um, it's kind of normal to um, kind of believe in um, things that we in psychiatry we call them delusions they're like fixed false beliefs that um, for example like hallucinations like things that you might be able to like see or hear like oh I can hear God speaking to me or like um, things like this but that is kind of considered normal like in that religion but I think that people kind of get their wires um, crossed in some respects and people kind of religion is um again like a very personal very personal thing but um there's kind of sometimes can be both can be mis misconstrued I guess what I was trying to say yeah definitely and then kind of I was something I looked at for that period was like kind of rather than how it was, as well as how it was understood I was also thinking about how if, if there actually was any formal kind of institutional help what was there I guess maybe some people, you people might know this already, but there was basically very little. And there were a few hospitals and like priories to kind of act as refuges. Refuse, did I say that right? <laughs> I think I did. Anyway, uh, to kind of, they, they did take some people in, but they were also kind of, there weren't enough of them and they could be very judgmental about kind of who they would take, take in. Like if they thought you had like a bad reputation for some reason, even if you need help kind of, religious orders might not accept you so mm -hmm. if you if religious order or like your family wouldn't help you very sadly lots of kind of people with like mental illness kind of in the past in that period kind of ended up homeless or in poverty which is shocking today yeah I I agree and what you're saying about um I mean the mental health is treatment wise has come such a long way and I think that's come with more understanding and research um in general and the way that we handle mental ill health um there used to be kind of what we call insane asylums and kind of people would be kind of shut away and thought that that was kind of it and there was no hope, hope or um they were given um ECT which is electric convulsive therapy which but in like really inhumane ways like without general anesthesia completely different how to how we do it now um, I don't know if that's um, anything you kind of explored. Uh, yeah, I kind of, things I was looking at was sort of kind of general mental health kind of history from like kind of medieval period up to basically today. I was looking at how kind of theories uh, mental illness kind of developed and changed and kind of how treatment changed. Those are the things I was looking at. Yeah, that's mm. so interesting. Go on, yeah. did you have, did you have more? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I had a little bit more. Go on, go for it. Uh, basically, kind of, I, I looked at a couple of case studies, and go for it. I think probably one of the, I would say one of the most famous examples of, of someone with like kind of who had like mental illness in the past is probably George the Third, kind of, he was kind of known as a, the Mad King, the Mad King in history, and at the time, but kind of, like within his own lifetime, he described himself as being nervous rather than. That was how he described himself, which kind of like kind of was like a at the time was like a new way to describe yourself if you had like kind of mental illness. It was sort of like kind of sort of like that kind of uh, that kind of explanation like kind of grew out of science of the time like neuro neurology, which was a new field, very new field then. Uh, neurology meaning like kind of studying the nervous system for anyone who wasn't sure about that. It's basically kind of it was thought that if maybe if your nervous system was damaged that was the what caused mental illness which was an interesting theory but you know I think that was a an important step that it was a lot less like judgmental than some of the kind of medieval and early modern explanations because it didn't blame like kind of anything about your character it more kind of was acknowledged there was something kind of I don't want to say wrong but something different about your body which I, I see was a pretty big step towards like kind of accepting kind of mental illness or like kind of thinking about in like a more kind of I'm, I'm not sure if I say positive but a more 
accepting, well, at least vaguely accepting way. Yeah, something more like it's not something that it's some it's more of a not a physical thing, but something that is kind of not under your power or control. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Do you have any, Do you have any last final? We've got Couple. one minute left. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone really quickly, actually. Yeah, it does. Like, that. like last final points I had was the so so in terms of the twentieth century things I was looking at was kind of the patients' rights movement in the 1960s, 1970s, and kind of how both like kind of various campaigns and the media kind of kind of helped like kind of create at least I would say more public sympathy towards kind of people with mental illness and more awareness about mental health as an issue. It was sort of like after people learnt about kind of you rough minute ago like kind of ECT and things like that and like other horrible treatments like that. I think a lot of people in public were kind of shocked about it. So they kind of started campaigning for mental health change. The change in mental health uh, change in mental health yeah but, yeah I'm glad we're kind of in that place that we are in now mm-hmm. <laughs> um but yeah thank you so much for joining us I know that it didn't feel like that long and this time really does go so quickly <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah thank you so much for joining us and I know it was short notice that you did as well so mm-hmm. thank you so much <laughs> yeah thank you and yeah I hope you'll join us for a little bit rest of the stream and remember to donate and yeah we are still trying to fundraise for Norwich Nightline um we'll probably try and get an update for you soon as to where we're up to with the funds and where we're going with that but we're going to be joined by our next guest I think we're going to go straight into that now so we were going to be joined by Katie Hicks who is the president of Labour Society but unfortunately she's had a little bit of a Um, hiccup that she's not able to attend so we are delighted to be joined by Elise Page who is also on the committee for Labour Society and we're going to be talking a little bit about politics and mental health and maybe a little bit about Labour as well so thank you for joining us Elise. We've got you muted. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Thanks sorry. (laughs) Hi uh, how are you Tori? Yeah yeah I'm doing really well thank you how are you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, I've got my cup of tea, so I'm doing well. Amazing. I I will need to go and get another cup very soon. I think I'm due a break in about half an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just for a little little break. But yeah. yeah, thank you so much for joining us last minute, like very last minute. Yeah, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, um, I'm always up for a, a bit of a rant about politics and yeah. um, how best to look after people. So. Yeah. And you joined us last year for the live stream we had in January. Um, yeah. In a slight, slightly different role, but we've got you here for for Labour. Um, yeah. But we're still talking about mental health. So, yeah. yeah. I'm, always, I'm always talking about mental health. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I know that you do kind of, you do share with your people around you, um, close-knit community about your um, mental health. So it's lovely that we have people that can talk about it and raise awareness but don't feel that you have to hear um oh, no, it's cool. yeah um, no I mean um, I, I usually do start with that basically like yes I am actually up. um so yeah I think I will um I'll kind of start from like my personal experience because I don't have much prepared or anything but I'll, go, I'll for go for it um yeah so I am the invisible disabilities officer with the labor society I um, have um, struggled with mental illness since I was a teenager. Um, it's always been ups and downs. I, um, I a couple of years ago, my nurses and some people at the wellbeing service said that I probably have BPD, which is a personality disorder called borderline, um, also known as emotionally unstable personality disorder. And it's quite um, misunderstood. So it's one of those things where I mean, mental illness has such a stigma already. And then if it's kind of a less publicised one, it's even harder um, to make other people understand. And that's something I'm going to be talking about a little bit later, about um, how the government needs to reform how it supports people with mental illness. Yeah, please do. I mean, it's lovely to... We haven't actually had um, 
many people talking about like specific conditions and I think that um, borderline personality disorder is one that as you said like people don't really know a lot about so um, if you wouldn't mind could you give us just kind of a brief definition of what it kind of yeah. is? Yeah, sure, there's no problem. So borderline personality disorder is a personality disorder and it's categorised um, by nine sort of major um, kind of traits that you have to kind of like fulfil about five of them for a diagnosis. But they broadly fit into um, affective dysregulation, which means that your emotions, you find it hard to regulate. Um, there's also when you have problems with impulsivity and the third one is I think I might be misremembering it is definitely one of the criteria um which is a sense of kind of emptiness and sort of um loneliness and a inability to uh deal with protection um so and it's it's kind of because it's a personality disorder um rather than a mood disorder like depression or anxiety it's kind of about the way that you you kind of you, you interact with the world overall um, although it does affect mood as well it can for a lot of people interact with depression and, and things like that so um it is quite uh it is it, it is one of those things that it's it's not very straightforward if if you don't really have much knowledge of that sort of thing so it is a bit hard to understand and the stigma like many mental illnesses is that oh you know it's oh it's your fault or it's like there's something wrong with you or something wrong with your wrong with your personality but it's it's really it's really a bit more a bit more complicated than that yeah it's really hard especially especially for the personality disorders because it's their the treatment around them is is really difficult as well and it's um a lot of it is about kind of the the experiences that you've had kind of within your past kind of shape you um, yeah. as, a, as a person and it's kind of some of it is a bit like protective mechanisms and it's kind absolutely. of absolutely it's nothing that you can do anything about um yeah it's not an easy it's not an easy thing to kind of to treat or deal with and it it requires um treatment plans that are really focused on the individual and are quite specific to borderline um for example dialectical behavioral therapy is um borderline re re responds quite well but it's not very well funded in a lot of areas a lot of um a lot of areas uh, don't have access to that sort of therapy, which is a real shame because people do respond really, really well when they have proper treatment, like a lot of like a lot of things, obviously. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's just such a shame when there's not the proper provisions or funding or funding there. Yeah, it's a real um, issue around mental health in general. I mean, people say that NHS but just mental health um, provisions and also like waiting times um, is, is a real issue for some people. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah, tell us a bit more, um, anything. To do sure. with, um, yeah. I mean, we didn't talk about um, labor or politics at all yet. So um, yeah, so um, yeah, if I had prepared a bit more, if I had a bit more time to prepare, I probably would have had some like really punchy statistics. Um, right. And obviously you haven't got, a whole load of time so I think what I'm gonna kind of focus on is the benefit system um, which is woefully inadequate in my personal opinion anyway but especially for those with disabilities including mental health problems um, and because mental health is often an invisible disability and the um, so if you apply for disability benefits for the personal independence payment, you have to go to an assessment. And um, the people that are employed are not, they're often within the healthcare system, but they're not necessarily experts in, well, they can't possibly be experts in every, every person who comes in. Um, so especially with an invisible disability, it is hard to try and demonstrate to somebody how you have problems with your entire life and with your functioning and with your kind of sense of self or your mood when they're asking you to stand up with your arms like that and you know being able to do certain demonstrations and it's I mean and that's just the tip of the iceberg that's just for mental health with PIP um and it is it, it's a really impersonal rushed system where there are yeah, 
so many people are denied personal independence payment for absolutely no no reason whatsoever. Um, I mean, just anecdotally, I know people who, from living with them, do need help and support and deserve help and support and deserve to live with like a comfortable and um, what's the word? Uh, and we have dignity. That's it. I know it began with a D. Um, we have like a dignity and that you can look after yourself and you don't and you're not forced to go and work in a in a um, way that's going to harm you or make your lifestyle more difficult. But so many people get denied just that little bit of extra help just because they can't demonstrate on the day or they're having a good day. Like you're punished for having a good day if you go to an appointment on a good day. And what if your bad day means you can't get out of bed and so you can't go to your appointment? It's it's absolutely wild and I just can't get my head around it. And that's one of the many reasons that we need need more reform on that. Mm, what would you say what would you say could be done to to help it to change the system, I guess? Uh Tori, you know me, I believe in giving everybody all the money all the time. So I'm probably not great on that one. <laughs> <laughs> like I say, if I had if I mean maybe that's giving myself too much too much credit that I I could have came up with a grand game plan for the whole whole thing but I think there needs to it needs to be less based on people need to be treated with less suspicion for one um there's definitely a culture that of you know benefit scroungers or benefit cheats when not only is that incredibly rare but it's so not the point and frankly if somebody I don't mean personally, if somebody wants to cheat the benefits and go ahead, you, you know, more money for everyone. Um, but that's really not the point because so many people have such like really like difficult issues in their life and they deserve to be treated with respect and believed. You know, if you go to an appointment and you say, you know, six days out of seven, I can't get out of bed. And they're like, well, you're out of bed now. Like, well, that's so invalidating and it doesn't stand well for society as a whole when this is you know this is government sanctioned suspicion of those with disabilities Mm. and yeah so that's one thing um another would be uh greater provision within kind of other areas of society like social care and the nhs and um all sorts of things where um to kind of support people before they need to seek help if that makes sense so support for people who you know maybe they can work but only a couple of days a week and that you know to be able to live on that or you know people being able to have therapy or or um things like that that's affordable and it's yeah there's prevention and then there's you know respectful treatment when you are very unwell those are my two things i think they come to mind yeah, I mean, we at Hedgecate talk about pre- prevention being one of the most important things with mental health, and that's why we go into um, workshops and in schools um, with primary and secondary students so that we can help with that kind of preven- prevention part. Absolutely. Of um, it's so important, and there are so many ways that um, mental health or me- mental ill health can be different different types of prevention you know either either before problems start or when they're sort of starting to become a problem to be supported in that um and there are so many ways forms that that can take such as um again if i had googled it and maybe got the statistics and like dropped the stats but there are definite there are links between you know if kids um go to school and they've got enough food you know they're warm their their home life is as good as it can be then you will have lower rates of all sorts of disabilities because you're as healthy as you can be. And that's that's one form of prevention. And that's something that that's sort of outside of Hedgecate's immediate remit because you've got all the wonderful things you do and then there's stuff that maybe the government could be doing to yeah. bring it back to politics. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And specifically um, Labour. Um, Labour is a political party as well. I mean, we spoke to Clive Lewis um, who is our local MP about uh, mental health and he admitted personally that he suffered with mental ill health and mm-hmm. and was really passionate about how it's um, how it's represented in Labour so yeah I think that's really important. 
Yeah. Have you spoken to Norman Lamb yet? Was oh, he yeah. On... Yes, he spoke yeah. to Norman Lamb as oh, well earlier on today. Yeah, I must have missed him because he used to be, I used to, well, my parents live in North Norfolk and he was my, he was my MP for He's He's also awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, he's he's lovely, and you can re you can still watch um, anything that was live earlier on during the yeah. stream. Um, he was our interview with him was around eleven o'clock ish. But oh, that's cool. for anyone that doesn't know, you can check the schedule on social media and find out. Um, but Elise, do you have any last like words of wis- words of wisdom, pearls to leave uh, us with? Uh, uh, worlds of wisdom, <laughs> worlds um, of pearls. Yeah, I'm just I don't I mean be kind to other people and. It, it's such a m- mental ill health and like everybody has mental health just as the same way you have bodily health and people can be struggling and you know you have to be kind not only on an individual basis but also in your approach to the to the world and the people around you I think we have to normalize these things in the same way we normalize bodily physical health so yeah yeah, my yeah. Thing. yeah thanks so much for having me Thank you so much, Elise, for that. And yeah, as Elise said, it's really important. Like, we all have mental health and it's just as important as, as physical health. So yeah, thank you so much, Elise. And I thank hope you'll enjoy me. the rest of the stream. And, yeah, And yeah, wow, we have nearly completed a, a back-to-back lot of live interviews. And we've got another one coming up in just a minute. But I think first we might be showing a little Movember intro video that was created by some of our educate lads so we're going to show you that and then we'll be going live to an interview with alexander lee from uea tennis five things worth knowing about men's health firstly know the numbers the top three causes of death in men under 45 are suicide substance and alcohol abuse and trauma due to intoxication two have open conversations talk about what's really going on listen being there for someone can be life-saving Number three, make man time. Stay connected. Spending time with your friends is good for you. Catch up regularly, check in, and make time. Number four, know thy nuts. Give them a feel regularly and get to know what's normal for you. Something doesn't seem right, go to the doctor. Number five, move more. Get active on a daily basis. Do more of what makes you feel good. Sort of blank screen. There we go. There we, now we're back. Oh, it's <laughs> oh. been one of those moments of nothing seems to want to work. That's all right. We're, we're back. back. Thank you, everyone, for bearing with us for that very short interlude. <laughs> but you did get to see our November yes. um, little introduction there, which was made by the Hedgecake guys. So thank you for that. And that leads us on very, very nicely to speak to our next guest. And we're delighted to be joined Look, by Alexander can Lee. Can you just give me a minute? Who is <laughs> Yes, I can. Okay, I'll give you a minute. We'll be introducing yeah. Alexander in just a second. Um, but for now, we will just give you a little update on where we are. We've got just this last interview before we're going to be heading into the last segment. Not the last segment, the evening segment. Yeah, carry on, Tori. You, my you internet, your internet, my internet uh, is forever hating on me. No, so so now I've frozen, I think. Yeah, so I have to keep on like <laughs> disconnecting my internet and reconnecting. And so people might be losing me for a couple of seconds at a time. But I am still here. I'm very much dedicated to the cause. So don't worry, I'm still here. Um, and make sure that you carry on interacting with us via the Twitch and YouTube and Periscope and via Facebook because we were getting some interaction in and I was trying to keep up with that but my phone has died and it is on charge so please bear with me for like the next hour I might not be replying as much but I am trying to still keep interacting with everyone but yep we're trying to raise money for Norwich Nightline and we have this statistic that if 6% of UEA students donate just one pound then we will reach 
our target of a thousand pounds for the 24 hours this we found out from Norwich Nightline from Jake Goddard so we would love to be able to reach that so we are counting on all of you who are watching um, at home to spread the word and share the stream and get it out there because we've still got well over 12 hours I'm not going to do the calculations because everyone has found out that I'm not great with my math <laughs> well while I'm trying to do a million other things and since I've been up since before eight o'clock on a Saturday which is probably not best for mental health but don't worry everyone I will be having a very long bed day tomorrow so um, you'd be glad to know though you can uh, we can now go over to Alex Lee uh, president of UA tennis all the technical governments has been sorted yeah. out uh, so without further ado here's Alex <laughs> thank you so much Alex <laughs> welcome hello yeah very nice to be here thank you for joining us today so, um, yeah, we're talking about mental health and um, mm -hmm. we haven't talked too much about Movember yet because we didn't want to um, spoil your thunder. So sure, do you want to yeah, tell course. us a bit about uh, Movember in general and then maybe a bit about UEA Movember? Mm -hmm. uh, well, essentially, Mo uh, what the, the roles of Movember is that, is that it uh, incorporates a lot of men's mental health uh, as, well, and, as well as targeting uh, prostate cancer and testicular cancer. And it's actually the leading fundraiser for all of the things that I've said. Um, and I think one of the really big targets is to destigmatize, uh, talk about mental health within uh, well, the male community, essentially. And uh, yeah, I think we've done really well. So I've just, I've just gotten an article up, actually. And it's actually, well, one of the projects that they funded recently has yielded really strong results when it came to um, prostate cancer. Uh, and essentially what, they're trying, what they've dis discovered is that um, well, it's, it's essentially it's just a t type of treatment uh, in order for uh, that that has proven and yielded really, really strong results. Um, but overall, this charity has done a lot of work in and has done a really big impact across the world um, in, in terms of bringing the male community together and to talk about some of the stuff that, well, which is the reason why I'm here to talk about men's mental health. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I didn't realise that Movember was uh, a nationwide thing. So that's mm. incredible. And yeah, go on. <laughs> I mean, well, essentially, I think it's an international corporation. So like it actually started, I was reading up a little bit about it earlier. So it actually started off with 30, uh, with 30 people just growing out moustaches, you know, having charitable events, doing everything from like, like the running, the walking, the cycling. Uh, and now it's actually built such a big community. I think uh, it's, it, well, there's about 5 million members all across the world that's doing it. Every, everyone from well, the US to England to Australia. So it, it's a cause that I think has gotten a lot better and a lot of people have gotten uh, behind it essentially, uh, which is really exciting. Yeah, no, it's great. And I guess the thing that everyone, the kind of image, cardinal image we remember about in November is the, the moustache because oh, everyone, mm -hmm. everyone grows, grows their hair out. <laughs> Sure. I mean, uh, you know, I'm trying my best uh, as well, but it's, uh, I don't think it's going it's to be as near as strong as some of my other members at UEA Tennis. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, I think uh, UEA in general, like we've done absolutely amazing this year. So I think over the last two years, we've only raised about 10 to 15,000 uh, pounds. This year, we've actually smashed that. It's now at 26 grand. Um, this is, this is, and we've had some absolutely amazing individual achievements as well. So the Joe Skeet, uh, the sports advisor, he's at 1,350. Vishay Carrier is, is almost touching a grand as well. Uh, and overall, I think that we've just brought the community together. Uh, and it's and it's a really nice push. It's really nice to see, especially throughout lockdown and that, how people are kept keen, being active. You know, the 444 challenge that you've recently come out, some of the fundraisers and stuff like that. It's It's been really, it's really fresh to see that um that the, it, this issue is not being overlooked even though we're going through a national crisis and a national like uh, an international lockdown uh, essentially yeah i think if anything it's kind of got us even more involved in it because mm. we realize even more with lockdown and everything that men talking about their their feelings and emotions is even more important than ever now mm. i mean i think i yeah, i completely agree with that i think it's like it, it's just I, I don't know what it is but it's just, I think throughout, like what well, whilst whilst you're growing up, you're always just perceived uh, men to always be strong, to to not actually show emotions, to essentially be a rock. Um, but the more that you think about it, right, we we are still human beings, you know. We we will go through the ups and downs of what daily life is. You get what I mean? So 
of, of course, you know, it's, it has to be destigmatized. It has to, like, people need to openly talk about it. So I think to, to all the guys out there, you know, if you, if you really are struggling, you know, if you really think that you've had a bad day, just just tell one of your friends, you know, because the, the likelihood is a lot of us will be, a lot of us will have experienced something similar to that. And it, and it's definitely something that, you know, I think that everyone has got a right to do. You get what I mean? Like everyone's got friends. Everyone worries about you. So why why is there a stigma behind it? Yeah, I definitely agree. And um, it's really lovely that so many different clubs and societies have been getting involved with no- Movember as well. Some that I um, don't think like would have done in the past as well. So it's been mm-hmm. lovely to see that like uniting of um, kind of clubs that are all all male and you know some that are mixtures and, and everything yeah i mean i think if you look at like i think even the economic society like the society itself has raised a significant amount of money uh towards the cause so so it's not it's not just to do about sports clubs as well like if i think Biosoc have done a few events as well um so so it's, it's kind of amazing to see that uh, it's, it's there's not just an, I feel like this year is not just an emphasis on sports clubs and sports teams as well, but actual societies outside uh, outside of sport, uh, you know, and they've they've also managed to get involved as well. And I think yeah. that's that's the that's what Movember's for. That's the emphasis of Movember is just to make sure that everyone is involved. It's just yeah. to try to get everyone on the same page and to support such a so, something that is so nice. You know what I mean? Some some something that is so important to everyone. Yeah, agreed. And um, with Educate, we're doing a collaboration with Yoga Society on Monday night where we're doing a little bit of fundraising for Movember. It's only a pound to join. So we're not doing any, uh, we're not going to be doing any massive fundraising. It's just a pound so that you can, you know, release a little bit of that stress. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we just want to do our little bit. But I guess for us, we, we try and talk about men's mental health um, throughout the year, um, I guess. But mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Go, sorry, go on. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, it's great. I, I think the thing is, I think uh, this I think this is the first year where I feel like that but all the dance and gymnastics clubs as well, they've gotten involved just as much. So I know um, Pole Fitness, they, they've done a little bit with regards to their, uh, they've got someone walking 60 kilometers for, because every single ma- a man dies every 60 seconds due to male suicide. Um, and obviously with the introduction of the student unions 444, which is to donate for, run for, uh, and, um, dominate for people, which is, uh, because three out of four men, uh, three out of four suicides are men, um, as well as the 111, which is soon to be coming out. That's, that's to do sport for one minute, uh, donate a pound and to nominate one other person. I think, uh, stuff like this, you know, it's really, it's really emphasized, um, that everyone can get involved with it you know you don't have to be physically fit you can walk it if you want uh, we've, with the amount of activities that we've put out there um uh, from the student union from sports clubs on its own i think it's just it's just managed to uh, well it's just brought such a good team spirit and it's just been co- so cohesive and i think the feedback we, that we've gotten off uh, doing all of this stuff is quite strong as well and that's the reason why we've managed to raise so much money yeah i definitely agree um, and just because, um, I mean, you're president of Tennis Society, so, um, I mean, not to put you on the spot, but what kind of things do you think may be um, a challenge within kind of sports and, and mm-hmm. tennis mental health wise? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think, well, I think um, well, throughout, I think it's, it's not, let's, let's not just talk about like, of course, I think within just the tennis club on its own, it's just you, you build, you, you are a part of a team, right? So I think one of the problem, one of the barriers that we need to break through is just that it's not just to, to, because you're talking about mental health, it's not a weakness. You are showing of the most vulnerable side of you, but because you're showing emotion, that's not a weakness that you have. And I think, and I think that's to, that's something that everyone has to emphasize within the club. You know, it's it's not demasculating to talk about your emotions. It's not demasculating to talk about your own mental health and your mental being, because at the end, especially throughout lockdown, right? Um, everyone's going to be talking about this. Like every, everyone's most likely going to be going through the same stuff, you know, um, because you're not. Well, it's it's a complete disruption in terms of what your daily life is. You're not used to having lectures online. Um, doing everything, uh, or inability to do sport, you know, inability to socialize. Um, but I must admit, I think sport is a really good release um, and something that I reckon everyone should get behind, uh, especially um, uh, throughout the lockdown. 
you know, I, I think, uh, well, I'm, I'm currently doing uh, 120 kilometers uh, to, to, throughout all of my, uh, November, November um, for the November challenge. And, and well, I've just hit my goal. I'm going to go for 200 kilometers now. Um, but it's just the idea of doing a physical challenge like this. It's not, it's just showcase you know, what we can do, you know, and it's just a release. Like, well, it's just a release of endorphins, isn't it? So there's a lot of science behind um, trying to improve men's mental health as well uh, through all of that. Yeah, and that is definitely something that would definitely encourage and promote that um, getting a little bit of exercise into your day, even if for you that's just going for a walk and getting some fresh air, or even if it's if you're not feeling like getting you know out of the house or getting out of bed in the morning, just like getting getting up um, and stretching um, mm -hmm. can even just be something really good for you. Um, but yeah, do you have any any take home messages for us, Alex? Um, I, I just I think I feel like I need to just uh, congratulate a few uh, a few people. So I think Joe Ski, a great job raising a thousand three hundred fifty five pounds. Uh, Vishay Carrier, he's done amazing raising nine hundred and seven. Uh, Mary, you've done amazing raising six hundred six hundred forty five. And Milo, you've done amazing raising three hundred seventy two pounds. And keep amazing. up the good work. Yeah, everyone has done so well. And remember, as much as we are fundraising for Norwich Nightline, that Movember is also going on until the end of November, until the end of this month. So make sure to get involved with that too. And there's so many different events kind of geared towards fundraising for Movember. So get involved. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us tonight. Um, it was great, you, great to chat with you. And so it's, it's past six o'clock um, and we were meant to have moved on to our next part of the segment yet, but we're just going to take a little breather. Yep. We're going to be switching over to the early evening segment mm -hmm. very shortly. So we're going to be switching the stream over. So for anyone that's watching on YouTube, Twitch or Periscope, we just need to refresh the page in a bit when we're live. And for Facebook, I'm going to be starting a new watch party and we'll be starting a new stream there. What um, will also be changing, of course. We will be moving over yeah. to Mariam, who will be hosting from 6 o'clock <laughs> for a little bit. And we've got some pre-recorded interviews and material to be showing you there. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. So it's pre-recorded back to back. Um, Phil Look, is muted. I'm muted. So I can't hear him. Of course I'm <laughs> muted. Of course I am. <laughs> what are you going to say, Phil? I, I, was just, I was just agreeing with what you were saying. I was like, yes, we've got right. um, all changed <laughs> now. So me and, me, me and Tori will go off your screen for a bit. Uh, it'll be Miriam presenting uh, the, the pre-recorded clips, the videos, and then we'll eventually uh, be back on your screen. We'll see you in a bit. Well, we'll uh, be back on the screen. We'll be in the quiz. We'll be in the quiz. Exactly what I was about we'll to say. We'll be in the quiz in an hour. Exactly. So we'll see you again <laughs> in an hour. But for me and for Tori for now, it's bye. And I will hand over the vision mixing over to uh, my esteemed colleague, George. So uh, see you on the other side. Bye-bye.